Hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this edition of the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. Uh, once again, we got out here today and uh, it's a rendezvous every two weeks. The Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals is a platform that brings together healthcare professionals who are Cameroonians uh, wherever they are around the globe. We always have people tune in from Israel, Japan, Canada, and we so far have had more, almost 35 countries on our database, those who have dialed in from different parts of the world. And so this is a platform that brings together doctors, nurses, lab technicians, midwives, researchers, scientists, public health people. And all our objective here is to have conversation on very important and key health issues that affect the lives of our people back home. And we try to make sure that we do this in a very respectful way. The town hall has always been a very peaceful place where people share their ideas and keep their emotions behind. And uh, I think uh, it's a very, very, very interesting platform where you are free to really, you know, friendly, in a friendly manner, really come kind of share your idea and really, you know, differ with the ideas of others while still keeping our respect as professionals. We have had uh, more than 60 sessions since we started, almost uh, getting to three years soon. So it's really an interesting uh, platform, one of which has been described as the only platform that actually unite Cameroon healthcare professionals. We want to thank all of you for tuning in for the, uh, to this session, and uh, we want to thank our regular uh, 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 viewers and uh, attendees who always take the rendezvous to spend this precious two hours of their Saturday to be with us here today. Uh, today we shall be talking a very important uh, topic, which is breast cancer. And now uh, we brought to you the best of those who will be able to speak to you to this topic. And of course, our own chair is one of the speakers, as well as a very, very trusted authority. Really, 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 really great to have her today on this session. And we are glad she accepted our rendezvous. And so today is going to be very spicy. But before we dive into it, let's just take a moment and uh, uh, go around to uh, get hear the voices of our co-moderators. Today, we sh I shall be co-moderating this session with Dr. Brian Tegomo, who is uh, one of the co-moderators and the uh, uh, pioneers of the Cameron Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. Hi, Brian. Yeah, hi, Elvis. It's, it's really great to be here, and and uh, and uh, thanks. It's uh, really great. I'm really excited about today's uh, session. I I think there's not a lot of uh, conversation around the the issues surrounding uh, breast cancer. I I, um, I I think it's a very important subject, particularly now that we we have this uh, you know National Breast Aware uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month uh, in the United States. I um, and uh, I remember Elvis when I had when I saw my very first patient with uh, with a breast cancer. It was at L'Hôpital Général in Yaoundé. I was devastated. This has really really been terrible. And uh, and uh, when I uh, looked up and I was uh, looked up the, the the statistics and the data and you know the disparities in terms of you know the survival rate, I was pretty uh, devastated by the by this disease. And uh, I'm really thrilled that we have. Um, um, some people uh, we have uh, 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 people to talk about this subject, uh, and I'm really thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mono, and also thank you to to uh, Andrew for uh, for uh, accepting the invitation to speak um, about uh, to speak on this subject. Uh, thanks a lot. I took some time to read about some of the things that you're doing. I'm really thrilled to see your activities and how you've. Um, really raised awareness around this disease, and and I really wanted to to applaud your efforts and and everything that you've been doing to uh, to bring an end to this really devastating um, uh, condition. So uh, thanks a lot for accepting the invitation. I'm really really looking forward to an exciting session today, and looking forward to an exciting uh, question and answer and discussion and all that. Thanks a lot, uh, Elvis. Over to you. Thank you, Brian, and I really agree with you that uh, this is a very important subject that is at least to talk about, uh, despite the fact that breast cancer seems to be one of the most uh, prevalent cancers in Cameroon. Uh, Unite for Health Foundation did some free screening for breast cancer, cervical cancer during the month of March in celebration of Women's Day, and we are stunned by the number of women who have never even just done a breast examination or talk less to think about the need for uh, breast cancer screening. So it is really important that we shall be discussing this topic today. And of course, let's get some thoughts about today's session from our own chair, Dr. Foreman. Well, Elvis, thank you very much. And uh... The only thing I want to plead is that we try as a community to make ourselves available. I try to get someone to replace me in this talk, 
but almost all the oncologists who were Cameroonians that I knew were pretty busy. And uh, so I had to do it myself because I could not get anyone to really uh, replace me. I got someone who is a colleague, but from India, but it didn't sound good for them to talk about breast cancer and all of that. So I'm just pleading on our community for us to engage more and try as much as possible to be available to help educate around sensitive topics. Breast cancer is the most common cancer in women worldwide. It's uh, either the first or the second in every country in Africa, playing first and second with cervical cancer, but it's usually the first in most places. So it's a very important sensitive topic. And uh, throughout my journey in oncology, this has been the most devastating call I get all the time from Cameroon. I have a younger sister, 25 years old, just diagnosed with breast cancer. Usually it's metastatic. By the time I start asking questions, even to physicians who are here, nobody has answers to those questions. So things that are important for us to actually guide treatment, nobody really has answers to those questions because it's a multidisciplinary subject and uh, we're still dealing with infectious diseases which are important, but the burden of disease and uh, chronic diseases are becoming also something we should and start talking about and start getting our healthcare system remarkable enough to be able to take care of those uh, problems. So I think today we'll really have a wonderful discussion. I would like to hear from our colleagues back at home and uh, see exactly what is being done, the things that are innovations that are taking place and uh, also the way forward, Elvis. And I know some people are trying to join in and they are having difficulties. I'm getting text messages from some of them. I don't know what's happening, but I think the house is going to be full. Of course, we think that the house is going to be full and thank you, Mono, for always stepping in. And if you, if not you, who else is your field? I mean, you are an oncologist and I will expect you to, even if you were not uh, uh, part one of the speakers for today, you would have still played a very important role um, in the audience. They're just sharing your own knowledge and expertise, which we really trust very much. And so thank you for always stepping in. And just like you said, the town hall is a platform where we encourage all professionals in healthcare to even suggest topic to us that they think they can be, uh, they can present on. So we do a lot of work to think about those topics beforehand and then look for experts to come talk to us, but we will always like to hear those who rather bring the topics to us and say they want to speak on this topic. It makes the job easier and it makes us to really have a diverse kind of topics as far as the town hall is concerned. Truly, we have covered topics in most as, uh, areas of healthcare. We've had radiologists come talk to us, anesthesiologists, we've had nurses, we've had doctors in different fields, cardiovascular surgeons. So the town hall has pretty much covered so many topics, but the topics are still enormous and so many other areas that we have not yet covered. And so we do call on all the experts, uh, Cameroonian healthcare professional experts from around the world, wherever you are, reach out to us and let us know your area of expertise and think about what you want to share. And we have a simple approach we use in the town hall. When you are talking about a topic, you're focusing on Cameroon and thinking about the challenges and the perspective and how we can make things better in Cameroon, maybe giving your best practice of what you know. And we encourage local presenters, those who are based home, we always like to hear from you because you understand the problems more than every other person can claim they do. So thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in on this session. And uh, since our chair is one of those to present today, there will, there will be no uh, updates on COVID. So we shall be going in directly to have this conversation today on breast cancer in Cameroon. Before we move in, I would like to call my co-moderator, Brian, to step in and just give a brief uh, introduction of our uh, guest, Angel, I know she didn't want us to talk much about her. She's done so just so much work, but some people like their introduction to be very brief. And of course, Brian is going to do the justice to uh, Angel by introducing her to all of us and maybe pretty much the work she is doing. Yeah, thanks a lot, Elvis. And, and, and again, thanks a lot for uh, giving, allowing me to present uh, um, Angel. I'm, I'm really, truly, truly, uh, truly honored and, and deeply humbled 
I, I was reading about her work just prior to this call, and I was really, really humbled by how much uh, her outreach and how much uh, she's done to uh, to raise awareness around this really devastating uh, condition. Uh, it's really, really been been uh, been amazing. Um, so, uh, Dr. Akui uh, uh, Anjo, she's uh, she's uh, she's the founder of an organization called Dare to Live with Anjo. Um, she's uh, she's been a cancer survivor herself. Uh, she was diagnosed with cancer in, um, in, in 20, 2018, um, and this was a triple negative uh, breast cancer uh, stage three. We're going to learn more about the different stages of cancer from uh, uh, Dr. Mono uh, later today. And she began treatment uh, in the 2019, uh, like in February 20, uh, 2019, which is pretty interesting because in, uh, in Africa, um, the, the, the time between you know be, being diagnosed and even starting treatment is pretty uh, can be pretty long, and the uh, survival rate for uh, most uh, women in in in, uh, in in Africa in Cameroon is is pretty devastating. So I I think uh, that's a really great uh, story as well. Uh, she had a, a year plus of uh, grueling chemotherapy and immunotherapy and radiation treatment, and she's been in uh, in remission. So she uh, created this organization called Dare to Live with Anjo uh, Anjo Foundation, which uh, I'm gonna drop the link in the chat. Um, and they've been doing some pretty uh, dramatic work trying to create and raise awareness around breast cancer among women, particularly uh, those in, in that age group and race and trying to provide more and more resources and services to uh, breast cancer patients and survivors. So it's really been um, it's really been uh, uh, exciting. Uh, I'm dropping the the link uh, for the uh, uh, for the organization in the chat, and and uh, I think everyone should uh, try as much as possible to support the work that they do as much as possible. Uh, thanks a lot, um, Anjo. Uh, we're really, really, I'm truly, truly humbled to introduce you, and uh, really, really humbled to have you today, and really looking forward to hearing more about this advocacy work and and really what you've been doing, what you've been doing in the U.S. and in in Africa and in Cameroon, and how this can be expanded to even other regions that have been significantly underrepresented in this uh, in this disease. So uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Akwe, and uh, it's really an honor to have you. Thank you so much, uh, Ryan, for that introduction. That is just exactly how she wanted it. We've not talked about her academics and the different achievements. Some people like to keep it simple, but I think it's really, really amazing to have someone like her speak to us, not just the science of it, but also every other dealing with breast cancer. And uh, I think it's going to be a very exciting session today. And uh, she is going to handle this session with Dr. Muno. And I, we were before the session started, and I was, uh, he was asking that, he, uh, that he's sure I will not introduce him. And I said, I can't even try because I'll be punished by the town hall. Who doesn't know Muno? He's our chair. He's one of the founders of this uh, initiative and the very first person who thought that we could do what we are doing and which has really grown. And I can tell you the town hall for healthcare professionals has grown tremendously. Each time when I sit back to look at the analytics from our uh, 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 so data set, I see that we have already exceeded 1,350 people who have dialed into this session either at least one time. And uh, the number of countries from where people have dialed in has increased from 33 to 35. This is really huge. And uh, we, have, we are getting a really, really, really um, good reviews from people that have attended the town hall. And uh, we are already having a promise from the Minister of Public Health that he is going to be on the session and we're going to tell you when. So it's exciting. Everybody's first today here we are having someone like Angel to share with us uh, the her story about cancer and also just what we need to know and what we need to do. Um, we would start the session by allowing uh, Muno to come in with uh, the first uh, part of the presentation, just to give some highlights about uh, the, the topic, the topic, and then we'll hand it over to the main person, who is Andrew Aqui. So thank you very much. And uh, I the order of the town hall for those who are tuning in for the first time is we always give the opportunity for our guest speakers to do the presentation. Then at the end of the presentation, we are going to go into the question and answer session, which is always very interactive. And um, at the end, we just get some final thoughts and feedback before we end the session. This session is always timed to, to last for two hours, and we always do our best to keep the time. Thank you so much. And let me hand over the microphone to Mono. 
Okay. So Elvis, thank you very much. And uh, I'm truly honored if I want to tell you to be part of those talking about breast cancer today. Let me share my screen. So uh, today is a special uh, session. And it's special because breast cancer is one of those diseases where if you are able to screen in medicine, there is something called primary, secondary, and tertiary screening. If you're able to screen patients and uh, get them early, then you're going to be able to really prevent this disease from uh, killing a lot of women because majority of those who die from breast cancer are women. Men also do have breast cancer. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the statistics back home in Cameroon and some of the statistics back home in Africa. So I'll be doing this session with Anjo and uh, she's special because she turned her demise from breast cancer into hope and uh, to try to help as many women as possible in our community get to know about breast cancer, get to screen about breast cancer, get to even seek for treatment and also mobilize the healthcare community including the Cancer Committee in Cameroon and the ministry also to get to advocate for women. So that makes her really special. She's a special person. And please go check her website. There are several activities happening in October, which is the Breast Cancer Month. And uh, you guys should donate for that particular website. And uh, the town hall is gonna make a pledge. I will make a pledge initially starting with the town hall, which we're going to pledge um, uh, $500 initially and others will chip in and we'll go from there. So Elvis, I want to say that uh, Cameroon is about a population of uh, 27 million looking at the country and uh, we do have uh, several cancers that do occur in Cameroon, but one out of 20, two point, 127 of every 100,000 person in Cameroon do has cancer. What cancer is the most common? The most common is breast cancer. And I'm going to show you that, followed by cervical cancer, then prostate cancer. Cancer is it in itself, it's a combination of many diseases. A lot of people really turn to ask me, what's cancer? There are different diseases that actually affect different tissues, which are on growing in an uncontrolled manner. And uh, you have abnormal cell growth cells or um, growth of cells. And uh, these cells can move from one organ to the other. I'm trying to keep it simple. And that's what we call metastasis. Once cancer has metastasis, then you cannot cure it. They, you just have to be able to keep the patient alive. But we're getting a lot of uh, changes in treatment and uh, also survivorship. Now, today I will talk more about solid cancer. This is a picture. It may look not look good. This is a breast of a woman in Cameroon. This is one of the pictures that was sent to me by uh, one of my colleagues who also goes to the comes to the town hall. We're talking about cancer, and he just sent me a picture once, just showing me the kind of patients they receive and what should they do. People have this there's taboo in talking about cancer in a lot of our communities. Then there are also liquid malignancies such as leukemias and lymphomas, which the pediatricians in Cameroon are very good at identifying. So looking at uh, the wall in general, Africa has the lowest rate of cancer diagnosis based on our size. So Africa, Australia, you do have 5% uh, of the number of cancer cases exist in Africa. And uh, it's because it's low, but the number is increasing and it's also underdiagnosed. And uh, the more you get civilized at times, the more you get into a society that smokes and other risk factors come in and obesity. We're going to talk about breast cancer being the most common cancer in women worldwide. It's followed by colorectal and other cancers, but breast is the most common cancer in women. And uh, breast accounts for about 29% in the US. So we still do see breast more commonly in my clinic where I work. Breast is one of those cancers we see a lot of times, but the difference in the US and in Africa is that majority of my patients get cured. They get healed and they are cured. Now, mortality for breast cancer has been dropping throughout this, the years that uh, since the 1970s, things have improved drastically. 
Now, getting back to Cameroon, you can see that 20.1% of all cancers is breast cancer. Reason being, this is a bit biased in the sense that breast is one of those organs that you cannot hide. So once a woman has metastatic disease, there is no way you can hide it. But there are a lot of women who move around with fungating masses that they have never allowed anyone to actually look at them. It's a completely different picture here where we have uh, a lot of primary screening. We do have mammograms that are mandatory for patients who want to and who go to their clinic. So you tend to have them, especially from the age of 40. Here you can see exactly if we do divide demographics, prostate cancer, which is one of those cancers we're going to look for time and talk about it down more. And uh, breast cancer, the most common in women, but in men you have prostate cancer. Another cancer that is important, the last time we spoke about cancer generally in Cameroon, we did talk about cervical cancer. Being one of those cancers you can actually prevent, meaning it's a cancer that you are not supposed to have by being able to vaccinate women and men, you can actually help prevent uh, cervical cancer, almost 100% eradicated like Australia has almost done. Now, our access to cancer treatment in Cameroon is pretty, pretty uh, a big problem. Very few centers do have uh, a, a capability of actually giving chemotherapy in Cameroon. And majority of them are concentrated in the South, not in the Northern part of Cameroon. And few of those centers can actually treat children who have other forms of malignancy. Now, looking at breast cancer in itself, as I told you, globally, it makes up 24.2% of all cancers. And uh, generally, the mortality of breast cancer is the second highest killer of, of, of all cancers back in the world when you take everyone in consideration. There are different screening guidelines. And I've always said, back home in Africa, there are times we cannot reinvent the wheel. You can look at several things that several countries do and try to put it in place a strategy that is going to be able to screen patients effectively, but with a bit of cost effectively, like the UK does it very well. They start their screening at 50, but they do every three years. In the US, we have several organizations that we're gonna talk about who advocate for screening to start at 40, and uh, others advocate for screening to start at uh, 45, and others at 50, and they do it every year or every two years, depending on what organization you're looking at. In Cameroon, there is just no guideline on screening for breast cancer, no. And this is gotten from the WHO website, but I don't want to negate the fact that there are NGOs, there are private institutions, there are even hospitals, which I'm gonna show you now that do screening. Breast cancer screening, there are several options. There is breast self exams, which is advised in uh, developing countries, countries that are poor, that do not have access to mammograms, but this is not advised in countries where there's accessibility to mammograms, simply because you have a lot of false negatives and uh, you do have a lot of uh, DCIS, which are missed. I'm gonna tell you what that is. So clinical exams by a clinical physician or someone, it's advisable also. Mammograms are ideal with ultrasound for patients who are less than 30 years, that's the key. Once you're less than 30 years, you have a dense breast, usually the mammogram is not the best test. Then you also have MRIs, which are pretty expensive. We don't even have MRIs for basic things. So you can imagine getting an MRI, which is adapted just for breast screening. It's rare. Now I will tell you about this is, so there are several organizations in Cameroon that have been trying over the years to educate our people about the act of self-breast examination, screening in particular, and also getting mammograms and accessibility to treatment. Anjo is gonna to talk to you about uh, what they have been doing and uh, how she got to that position of doing this wonderful thing that she's doing. And uh, I'm a big admirer of uh, her organization and what they have been doing. So they do have uh, the uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Walk, which they organize every year in October, one in Douala and one in Yaoundé. And I think as, the uh, situation gets better back home, they'll be organizing one in the Southwest and also in the Northwest. So I just want to applaud their efforts. Here is another flyer which I've been sharing this whole month while L'Hôpital General in Douala is actually doing screening. And they were supposed to do free screening for the first 100 women who come over to L'Hôpital General, but they are screening women 
from 18 to 75. I don't think that is like an effective way of doing it. They would have really gotten a group if they want to really get uh, women screened from the age of 40 or 50 and screen them, because those who are less than uh, 40 years, the chance of them having breast cancer is really, uh, it's, it's few, but uh, we will talk about that. Here is also what I saw Clinic La Catedra doing. So I'm just applauding that there are private institutions in Cameroon that are actually screening. Now, what causes cancer? In itself, cancer, breast cancer, like many other cancers, the most important risk factor for breast cancer is age. And you cannot change, so they are modifiable and non-modifiable. You realize that the more you get older, your chances of, because of getting breast cancer increases. So your lifetime risk is what we calculate. So just getting, being someone who is aging, that's why we start screening at a certain age. And we have realized that that age is kind of cost effective. And uh, starting it earlier, you need to have several characteristics. If you're examining yourself and you have a lump, then you need to get yourself examined. Now you see that not only breast cancer increases with age, majority of all cancers, breast, colon, and the esophageal cancer, lung cancer, they all increase with age. Though lung cancer has um, real uh, other risk factors like smoking. And uh, in Africa, we do think that we stay use firewood kitchens. We get a lot of soot from those firewood kitchens. Those increases the chances of having lung cancer too. This is a very interesting graph of uh, risk factors. And uh, the reason I like this uh, very well is because it's, I'm really gonna tell you that you do have, uh, from the time you're a woman is uh, uh, born, just her gender of being a woman increases her chances of getting breast cancer. Men do have breast cancer, but it's pretty rare. And each time she's aging, the chances of breast cancer increases. These are things you cannot modify. There are some families who have risk factors. There are some genes, I know a lot of you have heard about BRCA1 and BRCA2. Those are the most common. There is PAR B, there is uh, leaf amini. There are other genes that do increase your chances of having breast cancer. Majority of those who are dying young back home in, in Africa and uh, who are having triple negative breast cancers, majority of them do have BRCA, but they don't know about it. Especially in a family where you have uh, also pro prostate cancer, cervical cancer, um, uh, ovarian cancer, those are all familiarly related. You do have uh, early menarche, those who start having their men, their, their seeing their menses early. The more you're exposed to hormone, hormones, the higher your chances of getting uh, breast cancer. There is also other family histories which can be complex, late menopause. There is also uh, exposure to radiation. We have little exposure to radiation back home. Obesity is one of those things you can actually help. And our community is getting more obese over time. Lack of exercise for breast cancer. So eating a lot of processed foods is also one of the risk factors. Use of hormonal bed control pills. And uh, using hormone replacement therapy to treat menopause can also increase your, your chances, but very little. I would show you how much. Not breastfeeding also can increase your chances of breast cancer. And uh, giving birth at an, uh, an, 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 an elderly age also increases your chances of breast cancer and having no child also. So here you can see these are the different risk factors, but genetic is really one of the most predominant. And the BRCA gene increases your chances by almost tenfold compared to the other things. And uh, there are other genes that we'll talk about. So early menarche, meaning those who start, if a lady sees her menses when she's eight years old, there is what they call the rainbow uh, syndrome in um, gynae and obstetrics. You start at eight and you end very late and maybe 60. Those who start at 20 end at 40. So the more you have exposure to hormonal therapy, the more your chances of getting breast cancer. So you do have a late age of birth. You have uh, benign breast lesions, which I will not go into the details of those benign breast lesions, but those who are physicians here, that's why you should always send patients to pathology. Each time you guys do a biopsy or you guys take out a lesion, that's a culture that we should have. Hormone replacement therapy, alcohol use, and family. So this year, I just put in this slide just to show you that lobular carcinoma in situ increases your chances of getting breast cancer. But there are several different types. Pleomorphic type, actually, we treat it like DCIS. So I'm going to tell you what DCIS is. 
Now we have several strategies for those who take care of breast cancer patients. You want to be able to identify these benign lesions, either they are high risk lesions. You want to be able to check for family history. And there are certain tools that you can have. Now we have online calculators. You can have them from Cameroon, those who are practicing. And you can use the clause, the uh, Terra um, or Crozel model. There are several models that we can use. The Gill is really one of those models we use in order to re-stratify. Those who don't have breast cancer but need prevention treatment. I know a lot of you do have access to tamoxifen and uh, raloxifen and also the AIs, anastrozole, lestrozole, and all of that. Now, BRCA mutation, as I told you, we don't really test back home because it's difficult to test it, but a lot of Africans who have migrated here and have had breast cancer, they'll tell you they were BRCA positive. We tend to think this, especially those who have uh, family members who had breast cancer before. So BRCA is not something only that found in whites. There are a lot of blacks and blacks even have it more than whites. Lee Framini syndrome, I have a friend who has Lee Framini. There are several other genes, the PAL B2 and uh, which increases your chances of having breast cancer. Now, we do look at uh, several medications that are available that we can actually give them in order to prevent these women from having breast cancer, those who have high risk lesions. And those who are, and this is one of the places that we don't explore a lot back home. We need special, this is usually done here in the US by uh, breast surgeons most of the time. Uh, I'm sorry to tell gynecologists, truly the breast belongs to surgeons, so it's complex, but it depends on what society you're in, but for the gynees, there's so much you guys are doing, but the breast itself, it's good to have breast surgeons because the breast has so many complicated things. Pre-menopausal women, you can give them uh, tamoxifen and you can also do other tamoxifen, roloxifen, anastrozole, uh, lestrozole, those are all things you can do for prevention. Now, screening. Screening has been uh, one of those things that is difficult in medicine for us to have a consensus most of the time. So different countries have different uh, rules going on, but this has shown that we detect disease early, we treat it early and we prevent death. So for every woman who is 30 years old, if you go to see your doctor, make sure your doctor actually examines you and re-stratify you. By re-stratifying you, ask you about your family history. If your mother had cancer, your grandmother had breast cancer, ovarian cancer, you are one of those candidates that needs to get a genetic testing if you are abroad. If you're in Europe, you're in Asia, or you're in Cameroon, or you are in the, uh, the US. If you're back home, you may need to get a mammogram, actually, if you are above 30 years. If you're below 30 years old, you may need to get an ultrasound from a good, good, radiologist, not from a technician who is just doing ultrasounds. It's a very complex test to interpret. The, the, the radiologist in the house will tell you that. Now, if you are both 40 years old and you are financially fit back home, and I think this is something we need to advocate for the Ministry of Health to be able to do uh, screenings, free screenings for all women who are either 50 years and above or 40, depending on what the country can afford, and repeat it every three years like the UK does or do it every two years like it's mandated in the US or every year, depending on what state you are. After the age of 75, then your doctor has to decide if it's going to be advantageous for you to screen or not. So here are the different guidelines from different, uh, from different organizations. So we usually uh, stick to what WHO says. So from the age of 40, right up to 50, it depends on your physician and your risk stratification. I would even say from the age of 30. Now, from uh, the uh, between the age of 50 up to 75 years, then you can actually do, you can you have to do uh, mammograms. After the age of 75, WHO recommends you to discuss with your doctor, your physician. This is the same thing for those who are interested. I'm going to share the slides with you guys so that you have it and you're able to use this. So these are just imaging that showing you the difference between the different modalities that we screen. Radiologists will understand this better, but I'm not gonna waste time on this. For those who have never seen a mammogram, this is how it looks. And most women will tell you it's not very comfortable. So you need to prepare your mind, but you need to educate them about the risk versus the benefit. Who is gonna benefit from a mammogram? Any woman who is above the age of 30. 
is going to benefit from a mammogram. If you're below the age of 30 for screening, we use ultrasound screening and we can add a mammogram on it or we can add an MRI. Now, this is an ultrasound. It's a, a lot of you guys know ultrasounds. You use them for different things. You use them in your GYN uh, and those who are here, you use them in order to get access to lines. But please, breast ultrasound is just not any kind of ultrasound. You need to be trained and be able to identify and suspect lesions. Now, we do know that we have uh, MRIs for certain women, especially a lot of Black women who have dense breasts, those who are young, those who have a, a family history of breast cancer, those who have BRCA gene mutations, you may want to pick up lesions early. So it has a very high sensitivity, low specificity, but it's better in screening for high-risk populations. So high-risk populations are actually people that we do know that uh, their chances of developing breast cancer is pretty high. So here are just some of the advantages that uh, an MRI has. This is an algorithm for those who are clinicians who want to practice and actually screen whom do you screen for with an MRI. I'll talk about this later. So there are some key points I want everyone here to take back home. If you're back home and you have a family history of breast cancer, you're less than 30 years, make sure that once you're being screened for breast cancer or you have a lung, make sure that you get an ultrasound from someone who is capable of doing it. If you're above the age of 30 and you're going for one, then you need to get a mammogram and they could add an ultrasound. There is a difference between diagnostic and uh, screening. Usually in diagnostic, we do an ultrasound, we do a, a mammogram and we add an ultrasound to it. Once we have a suspicious lesion, then we need to be able to stage it, to diagnose it. So I always say there are different kinds of lesions that you can see when you're examining patients. I know Facebook may take down this, but you want, there is an, in, they, there are several things, known palpable abnormal images, you could see them when you do imaging. There could be patients who have palpable painless mass in their breasts, enlarged lymph nodes. If you know what lymph nodes are, lumps and bumps everywhere in the body. You could also have nipple changes, discharges, invasion of the nipple could be a sign. There could be skin changes, what they call pulled orange, meaning the orange skin of uh, the body looks like the, the peeling of an orange. Then you do have breast pain and heaviness also. I know with this, uh, poor communication saying that once you have a mass which is painful in the breast then it's not cancer, it's not true weight. So it's very important that we get to actually get tissue. This is one of the most difficult things in Cameroon, getting tissue and analyzing tissue and doing the right thing on the tissue. I found out that this is one of the most difficult thing because we don't, we, our, our environment is not set up to actually be able to do stereotactic um, uh, biopsies. Ultrasounds, guided biopsies can be done. Core biopsies are usually preferred for breast cancer. So here is just showing you the importance of tissue. I always tell this, where there is no tissue, there is no issue in oncology. Tissue is your meat, it's everything. Why? I will tell you a story. I got a patient in Cameroon, young lady, she was already dying. She's uh, a family friend. Someone called me. I never knew I knew her very well. She has been treated for breast cancer. I asked for the pathology. They actually did a pathology, but they did not do a progesterone level. They did not do an estrogen level. They did not do a HER2 level. They just started her on chemotherapy. And once I asked for this to be sent to Central Pasteur and they sent it out, she was ERPR positive. This lady, even with metastatic disease, would have done so well on hormonal therapy. And it was a sad scene for me because I met her when she was already dying. It was the saddest thing I've ever reflected on. And it tells you not all the time as physicians that you give medications that you're doing good. You could be harming patients. And she had breast bilateral mastectomies done for her when she never needed them because she already had metastatic disease. Metastatic workup was not done. It's sad. Never feel that because you are a surgeon and uh, you want, you can, because you can cut things, you have to cut them. Neither do you feel that you are an oncologist because you can give chemotherapy, you have to give chemotherapy. There are patients who do just fine on hormonal therapy. And this goes down with all cancers. The, 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 there, was a, there was one of my professors who usually says that those who know very little know they don't know anything. And it's a big thing in medicine. Those who know a, a little bit feel they know everything. And those who know more become humble again. 
because they realize how complex the field is. So please, we need to work in teams. It's a very complex field. So there are several ways of getting biopsies. I'm not gonna waste your time here to talk about this, but let's get tissue. At times, if we get fine needle aspirations are usually not the best, but these are things that we could get. Usually you will not get the architecture and you'll be able to try. Excision biopsies, the disadvantages of excision biopsies is just that most of the time you have to come out for a second look in these patients and it's expensive and they'll have two surgeries. And most of the time back home, nobody's gonna tell you if the margins are positive or negative. Now our pathology, what I'm gonna insist on is the, the type of tissue is fine. For breast cancer, we need to know the oestrogen, the progesterone, and the heart to level. Please, if you are going to be working in any place, or if you're a patient, you have breast cancer, you have a family member, ask this question, because they guide treatment. And the treatment can be as benign as taking a tablet. And you're gonna do fine for many years, even if you have metastatic disease. Now, there are several things that we do. We try as much as possible to stage patients. We wanna know exactly what stage these patients are. And uh, we do that, there are certain criteria as physicians, we tend to do additional tests in order to know if they have local disease, local regional, because the management is gonna be different. We use something called the TNN staging, which is tumor, lymph nodes, and metastasis. If you have metastatic disease, let's say in the bone, in the liver, there's no need doing a mastectomy, please. You're just wasting a patient's uh, time, unless you're doing for cosmetic reasons and the patient knows. And uh, most of the time, if you do that, even the, the wound is not even gonna heal what you're trying to do. So it's important that we do know that a bone scan, if localized pain is very important, if there's alkaline phosphatase, which is high, breast cancer goes to the bone very well. It also goes to other organs. So at times these patients will need a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. At times you may need to also assess for axillary lymph node involvement. So PET scans, they are rare in Cameroon. I'm not gonna talk about it because we don't even have them. Now, how do we treat patients with breast cancer? How do we treat cancers overall? We do have several modalities of treatment, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy, bone, hormone, and targeted therapy. So there are local treatments where you tend to do surgery and take it out. Systemic treatments are treatments that you give patients and they take them by mouth or IV. And there is something in oncology called adjuvant and neoadjuvant, meaning at times the cancer could be so huge, but it's still an early stage cancer that you want to give chemotherapy or hormone therapy to reduce it. And there are times when you may want to give treatment after because you did a biopsy and the stage is more than what you think it is. So in terms of uh, treatment, you do have surgeons in breast cancer, you have radiation therapists, which are involved. That's where we are lacking also. You have chemotherapies also where we are lacking. Majority of our patients die from chemotherapy complications because we don't have the support staff to give it and the support medication. On the other hand, hormonal therapy is easy, targeted therapy is easy, but we don't have a lot of them. And immunotherapy can be easy to give. Palliative care and supportive care is lacking in our community also. So surgeons are actually, there is something called, I would show you. So once you have patients who do have doctor carcinoma in type two, these are like pre-cancer state, but in breast, we really consider them like breast cancer. A lot of them, you could do a lumpectomy or mastectomy. There is this question, should you do take out a little part of the breast or take out the whole breast? In Cameroon, I'm going to always advocate for the whole breast to be taken out, especially if you're sure that there is no cancer, there is no metastatic disease. Why? Because we are bad at identifying negative margins. We are terrible at pathology. And uh, because of that reason, most of the time, cancer is left, at, left back behind. So, the key for you to know is that there are several options for treatment certain times with DCIS, which is a pre-cancer state, but it's actually considered the first uh, stage zero mal um, breast cancer, where you can do several options. You can do mastectomy, taking out the whole breast, or you do lumpectomy and radiation. Radiation is expensive, it's not accessible. There are just three centers in Cameroon, two are non-functional, L'Hôpital General, Wala and Yaounde non-functional, there's a new radiology center, which is functional. And then you can give them hormonal treatment, which is easier. 
So these are several options that you can do for patient. Here, I showed you this picture to show you that being radical is not always the best. For years, trusted, there was a trustedian philosophy in medicine where you remove cancer from the roots. And this is something for surgeons to learn that, and now we're seeing it in oncology, I can talk about this during the discussion period. There are times that cancer may look localized, but it's already circulating in blood. No matter how deep you go, no matter how you deform the patient, they may still have reoccurrence. So this is what we used to call radical mastectomy here. Women used to have this with the pectoralis measure, everything taken out. As years developed, we realized that modified radical mastectomy was as good as radical mastectomy. And we realized that lumpectomy in localized disease is as good as mastectomy if radiation is done. So, but the question is, can we do radiation back home? No. Can, we, can all patients actually have access to radiation? Very few can. So there are some contraindications to patients getting mastectomy, and we're going to talk about this. These are some of the complications of taking out lymph nodes. You could have uh, lymphedema, shoulder dysfunction. So right now we do something called centenary lymph node marking in patients. And this is how it's done. And it's also difficult to get this done back home in Cameroon. Very difficult in order to know if this lymph node should be taken out. Now, in terms of treatment, you have to stage your patient and know exactly what kind of breast cancer they do have. And this is going to help you in order to treat the patient. Are they triple negative? They have one of the worst prognosis. Are they HIR2 positive? Are they estrogen positive? From this alphabet soup, we can create almost four groups. Now we have a fifth group called HIR2 low, which I'm not going to talk about now. But this is just the algorithm for you to know how these patients are treated. For someone who has progesterone and estrogen cancer, the main treatment modality is endocrine therapy. And this appeals most of the time. You give them and they do well. So now radiation therapy is another mode where we do treat patients. These are the machines, complicated machines, difficult to have them. Cameroon right now, I know of three centers. Others may tell me other centers. There is one which has a machine in Douala, which is very functional. I'm not here to advertise them, but they are good. Something is good. You have to let it know. They are just starting up. I think they are going to expand and the government may learn from them. Chemotherapy, on the other hand, you have to know how to give it. You have to train nurses. You have to train chemo nurses. What we do in Cameroon, we're very good at training doctors and forgetting the auxiliary staff that work with doctors. We don't have physicists to help us with this uh, big machine. So when they get bad, we don't know what to do. We don't have dosimetries. We don't have uh, nurses that are trained in chemotherapy. We just don't have palliative care nurses, hospice nurses. This is all lacking. And chemotherapy has several effects that we could talk about. And uh, how to use chemotherapy can be a very complex topic, which I'll be ready to answer some of your questions depending on what chemotherapy we're going to deal with. Hormonal therapy can be a good resource because majority of breast cancer, almost 60 to 80% of them, depending on where you're from, are actually estrogen or progesterone positive, and they're going to need hormonal therapy, which is the more main way of treatment. So here I just show you exactly how hormonal therapy works. A lot of you do know tamoxifen, and this is an alphabet soup of what we combine. You don't need to know their names, but those who are interested, we can talk about it the things we give to patients, and uh, some of the side effects that you need to know if you're going to be prescribing this medication to, 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 our, to our patients. I'll provide the slides to you guys. For patients who are HER2 positive, this is the modality of how we treat them. Things are changing every day in oncology. Medications are becoming available, and we're having problems having access to these medications back home. There is something called uh, transduzumab duroxtecan. It's a new medication for HER2 positive cancers. It's miraculous. It can actually work for hard to low, which is something new, a new classification, but we don't have them back home. Now, when we talk about targeted therapy, it's more about getting the Achilles tendon of the cancer. We see this in all cancers now. Oncology is moving to personalized medicine. Also in breast cancer, we do have targeted therapy. So here is an example of lung cancer, the different targets that we have and uh, what we can use to treat. So here you can see multiple cancers can be treated by one drug. If you have that particular target, let's say you have R2, you can use transduzumab, which is Herceptin, it's available in Cameroon. 
but there is other drugs that we can use like transfusumab, durosticum, we can use uh, tocaptinib, naratinib, those are all medications that would help you in this patient. And uh, giving a patient who has had to breast cancer, there is something we use called the Clopatra regimen, it's a combination of four drugs. It's gonna be so difficult to give it in Cameroon that majority of the patients would die from the side effects because labs cannot be done easily, the accounts will get low, for them to get Nupogen, they are going to be able to buy it for like a million francs, CFA, it's just so complicated. This is a patient who got targeted therapy, had melanoma, you can see how they evolved over time. I didn't want to put one with breast cancer. So you see targeted therapy is actually the way forward for certain kind of breast cancer, even triple negative breast cancer, there is hormonal therapy we're using. And uh, just keep in mind that cancer treatment is getting better. Our problem in Cameroon is access. Do we even have hormonal treatments that have been available for years now? It's almost celebrating almost 20 year anniversary of some of these uh, immunotherapies, but we don't have them available. They are not accessible and uh, our patients are really suffering. Even when they're accessible, the price is really uh, dawning on the patients. Some of them have, do have side effects. There are other technologies like CAR T cells, which is gonna take us some time and we need to really be proactive to have them. Now for metastatic breast cancer, you can see here that over the years in the US, the number of cases have reduced, mortality has reduced, and uh, we are getting really better in defining goals for these patients. So the goal, I'll put this slide here for the physicians who are here, please. Each time you have a patient with metastatic disease, make sure that you have this data, the ER and PR status, and this shows you the dead rate, triple negative cancer, what Angel had, and it's usually the most deadly. And most young women do come up with that. So there are several modalities. I'm not gonna give you all the drugs, how to treat them. We can talk about that during our session of discussion. And uh, there are several medications that we can combine. The only sad part about it is that I was checking, majority of these medicines are not available. So it makes things really sad. and. Uh, the algorithm is here for you to be able to treat your patients and know exactly what to give. For these patients, those who are physicians, I made this for you guys to be able to look at. Those who are residents, who are doing a residency in oncology, some of them promise to be here. I'm gonna give you this slide. Now, pregnancy. Can you treat a pregnant woman with breast cancer? The answer is yes. Okay, so pregnancy itself is not a contraindication to treat patients who have breast cancer during pregnancy. We need to avoid CT scans, but we can actually do shedding. The, guy, the radiologist can actually help you with that in order to stage some of these patients. You can give chemotherapy in the second and third trimester. You can also do surgery in all trimesters. And there are some drugs that you should avoid. Radiation therapy is after pregnancy. Fertility issue is one of the last things I'm going to talk about. It's usually a big problem for those who are in the fertile age. Majority of them, some of them may get sterile. So you want to be able to work with a gynecologist in order to prevent them from becoming, we have an issue with this because reproductive medicine back home is also lacking. That's someday we'll talk about this topic. Male breast cancer, 1% of breast cancer is found in men. So men who are locked in here, do not forget this. The treatment for male breast cancer is similar. The demographic is similar. We do mastectomies rather than lumpectomies most of the time. They also have similar risk factors. Genetic is mostly the predominant. Increase in age, being black, so those who are here doing obese and uh, hormonal therapy is going to increase your chances. BRCA1 and BRCA2, those who have had prostate cancer in the past. So overall, you can see here that the treatment modalities are the same. And those are the same treatments that we do give for those who have uh, females with breast cancer. So there is also something called inflammatory breast cancer, where in this case, you cannot do a lumpectomy. You need to do, take out the whole breast and you have to give treatment before. So in these situations, we do also treat women. I've seen cases like this, and it tends to be more common in black women. And uh, this, the future is really bright, but in Africa, I don't think it's bright. In Cameroon, we have very few treatment centers for radiation. We don't even have accessibility to hormonal therapy. Novel targets, which are conjugates, we don't have accessibility to. There is something called liquid biopsy. We're not able to do that. So cancer treatment is really difficult. Now, this is the strategic plan. We're going to discuss this going forward. Cameroon has a plan in the future. And the plan is really to 
be able to treat patients even at the local level. But this is still, even at our university teaching hospitals, most of our equipment are unable, we're unable to actually make them work. So here you can see exactly the budget and distribution of the distribution of cancer in Cameroon. The Northwest tended to have more because they do have many centers that actually do treat these patients. So they report more. And here is see the same data we talked about last time. And uh, I'm going to talk about this data later on. So Elvis, I would like to talk about the Cameroon Oncology Center, not because I want to, but they are one of those who are actually trying to do something positive. But the question is, do they have, they have a lot of uh, collaborators abroad. My question is how sustainable is it gonna be in Cameroon? Can everyone afford it? And uh, do they have all the different specialists that are going to be able to run this center? I think so. They're trying to do a good job. L'Hopital General too in Douala. So I think the future is bright, but I want to give time to Agri to tell us her story. And then Elvis later on will move on from there. So you can, you can move over to Agri's presentation. I'm going thank to leave you. my slides here and I would uh, do the slideshow for Agri. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mono, for this exciting presentation. If you don't mind, you can stop the slide share just for a few minutes oh, while, we, sorry. while we allow you to get some a glass of water. We just get a break and, and just get a pulse in the house and feel the temperature before we bring in our main guest as well. Both of you are presenters. We see your face every day, but Anqui Anjo is just that person we are anxious today. And you set a very good pace for her. And I'm sure her presentation is going to be really, really, really uh, exciting. And so let's, you can stop sharing your screen. And I'll ask Brian to just call some random names that he might want to check on as a part of our way of uh, doing the temperature check. Hi, Brian. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elvis. I, 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 uh, and, and I'm really grateful. It's always um, excellent presentation from, uh, from, from Dr. Mona, always. I think he always really gives or provides us with excellent summaries of the, uh, of the state of the field and, and where we are in terms of, uh, of cancer management. I was really... Um, Sorry, TJT, TJT, maybe you can mute. Yeah, I was really flabber, um, really blown away by the 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 figures, the 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 data he showed from Cameroon and that really wide disparity in terms well, of. Really yeah. Okay, I yeah. have to try to find a way to mute. Um, don't worry, TJT, you have to mute. Okay, thanks. Yes, Brian, go on. Sorry. Yeah, so I, I think that the, it, it's, uh, th that disparity is pretty uh, wide, and I, and I think that if there, there, there are definitely ways for us to increase awareness, we need to, you know, we need to definitely figure out ways to diagnose the, the condition even more, and the earlier I think, the better. So I think uh, Dr. Mona really laid out a really great and excellent um, excellent introduction, and uh, I just wanted to scan a little bit through the town hall and maybe hear some thoughts. I think uh, Dr. Mono talks a little bit about biomarkers, and I wanted to talk to, I wanted to call on Dr. Kenji to hear his thoughts and his point of view. I don't know if uh, Kenji um, is available. Maybe uh, really wanted to hear particularly his, his take uh, from maybe from a clinical laboratory perspective in terms of biomarkers for, for cancers and, and uh, the, the, the state of the field and, and how this can really be improved. I know in the United States in the developed world, we have more of these technologies and platforms, but really how do we start thinking about really, you know, developing, you know, some sorts of biomarkers. I, I saw one of present a slide about some very specific genomic markers for uh, certain cancers. And I'm just wondering, uh, Dr. Kenji, what, what your thoughts are really on the presentation and uh, where you think in terms of diagnostics, uh, laboratory diagnostics, where you think the field is, uh, is possibly headed. Uh, Dr. Kenji. Okay, let's assume that uh, Kenji has, is going to be back with the response to your question. And I think that question will really be very interesting during our discussion as well, since Kenji is not. And let's just get Gladys happy. Gladys, what's your impression of uh, the first presentation show so far before we get to uh, hear from uh, Angel? 
glad is happy. You are our regular um, member of the town hall. Okay, Gladys. Okay, let me call Frida. Frida Mbolo, any word from you? Just to check and to know, uh, this is a way we always want to check the engagement of our participant. We just call the names randomly. Frida Mbolo, any word from you? How you enjoying? The, how you enjoying the session? Yeah, it's very very interesting to hear about um, cancer in our setting. I had the the presentation of the the doctor. It's quite interesting, and so far, with respect to the the values he presented, I think still cancer is still under reported in our setting because we have a good number of patients recently presenting with uh, other cancers, especially colorectal cancers. It's been the talk of the day here, but we don't have the treatment, the facility to report it and all that. But breast cancer, so many people are becoming aware of it and uh, it's still underdiagnosed somehow. So I'm, I'm glad that he's talking about it. It's going to help us also to create awareness wherever we find ourselves. Thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, Muno always say that if you don't look for it, you will not see it. And so I'm glad to hear that. Um, one last person I'll call to just check the temperature before we bring in Andrew is Raiza Nana. Hi, Raiza. Hi. Can you put the volume down, please? Sorry. Hi, um, thank you very much for the great presentation, Dr. Muno. It's very, it's always very enlightening to listen to you and to all the other speakers on the town hall. Um, this is a very, uh, it's a very important topic and it's very relevant to, I mean, what's going on in Cameroon with the various challenges, both in screening and diagnosis and management, which you've all um, beautifully elaborated. And I look forward to the, the input from all the other um, members of the town hall at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Raiza. Thank you. And I'll go an extra mile because I know Weber Joseph is on duty right now and uh, he did the effort to really just tune in. Uh, Weber, tell us where you're tuning in from and uh, just a few words. Weber Joseph, you're on mute. You're, you're... Hello. Yeah, we can hear you now, Weaver. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I want to say that it's always a very great pleasure listening to Dr. Monu, whom I have inboxed for a couple of times for us to kind of uh, shape opinions and ideas. Uh, Town Hall, I must say that you guys, you are doing a very great job and uh, it's very useful. It's very, uh, for some of us who are we in the field, the challenge is really, really enormous, especially in the periphery. The periphery, uh, it is still uh, like in the dark forest. And uh, my wish is always to see how we're gonna kind of get a tumor board, a tele kind of telemedicine tumor board, like and always each time we have a challenge, we can be able to, at least like in the town hall forum, uh, discuss it before engaging treatment and all the like with the uh, review, what can be very available around and things like that. So, uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow. Good evening, Dr. Mono. Thanks. Thanks very much. And where are you? Uh, where are you today? Good evening, where Dr. Weber. Hello. Where are you tuning in from today, Dr. Weber? Just no, I'm in Yaounde. I'm 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 calling from Yaounde. I'm just from doing a a, a lumbectomy, breast lumbectomy, uh, for, for you know. I'm you Yaounde. Know? You are the man on the field and you're just the right person to be here at this point in time. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here up to this moment. And now is the time we bring to you, Anjo, our guest speaker today, who is going to give us her presentation. Hi, Anjo, feel free, Muno, to share your screen and let her take the discussion forward. Um, thank you, Elvis. And um, thank you to the town hall team and Dr. Muno for inviting me on here. It's um, always a pleasure. I'm always honored to share my story with the hopes of um, creating awareness or just inspiring someone out there. Um, so I'm going to give a brief introduction about myself, my story. And like Elvis said, 
we have we are going to focus on Cameroon, um, what's happening in Cameroon and the work that I'm doing back in Cameroon and not here. But I guess I'm relevant because I'm a Cameroonian and I'm doing work back home in Cameroon. So my journey with cancer started in 2018. I am that girl that never did have breast exams. I'm that girl that did not take cancer serious just because there's no one in my family that has had any type of cancer. I'm, I'm not overweight, I'm not obese, and I'm very active. I do exercise and I eat healthy. So I never thought about cancer, never dreamed that I needed to even take it serious. So I wouldn't even pay, I, I, I didn't pay attention to cancer. I moved to the US in 2011. Prior to moving here, I really did not know anybody back home that had um, cancer or breast cancer. I knew one person and she was in her forties and she's based um, between Cameroon and the US. So for me, I, I couldn't really, you know, breast cancer was something I thought about a lot. But in 2018, um, I did feel a lot of pain in my breast towards my armpit. So it wasn't even like um, my breast, like maybe around the nipple, it was towards my armpit. I felt mm -hmm. that pain um, a couple of times and I ignored the pain, but they just felt it that the pain was really sharp and persistent. And when I tried to feel the area that I felt, the, the, when I tried to feel on that area, there was actually a lump that was like the size of maybe two or three cubes of sugar. I don't know how I missed that lump, you know, and I only felt the lump that day when the pain was really persistent. Again, I'm not even thinking I could have breast cancer. I'm young. I was 33. Again, I know nobody that has cancer. So I went to the hospital to get it checked out. They checked it out and I got the bad news that um, I had been diagnosed with breast cancer. It took a couple of months, um, say a month, for them to do extensive um, exams to know what stage I had, what type of cancer I had, if the cancer had spread, where it had spread to, and what my treatment um, route would be. So that took about a month and a half. And then in February, they told me I had triple negative breast cancer, stage, stage three, that had spread to my lymph nodes in my armpit. Um, so I, I had to do treatment. And my treatment route was um, chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. My doctor told me that I didn't have to cut my breast off. Um, I had the option of just sticking out the lump. And Dr. Weber just said he left from doing a lumpectomy. That's exactly what I, I, I that's, that's what I had to, I had a lumpectomy. So after my chemotherapy, my doctors just took out the lump that was left um, from the side of my breast and then that was it. So when I started my treatment, I decided to share my story on social media. I did that because I just wanted to inspire people that no matter what they're going through, um, don't, don't like just trust the process, do what you have to do, you know, follow your treatment, listen to what the doctors are saying, hold your head up, be strong, have faith and pray and just, you know, pray that everything goes well. And the reason why I decided to share my story during treatment was because I had gone through something similar, not cancer, but I'd had some health issues earlier that I always felt like I wish I shared my story because I felt like there's maybe more women out there that are going through what I was going through. And if I just um, shared what I was going through, it may have helped or inspired someone, but I could not share my story at that time when the idea came to me because I had overcome it. So I had um, multiple miscarriages. I had to take out my lymph, I had to take out my, uh, my, my fallopian tube. I had ectopic pregnancies, I lost twins. And when I was going through that, it was really tough. That was like 2016, 2017. So when, when I finally had my baby in 20, um, 2017, I wanted to share my story about um, miscarriages, ectopic pregnancies, but I felt like it may not really resonate with people that were struggling to conceive because they say, oh, easy for you to say now you already had your child. That's why it's easy for you to come out and share your story, blah, 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 blah. 
So I, when I was going through the cancer phase, I said, you know what, I'm going to share my story while I'm going through treatment so people can see that it's okay. You know, yeah, it's cancer. Yeah, I may die, but I'm strong. And the, the, the few days that I have on earth, I'm going to use it purposefully, you know, share my story. So when I shared my story on social media, I had a lot of people reach out to me. The group that kind of struck me were the women from Cameroon. Mind you, I didn't even know that. I didn't know any woman in Cameroon that had breast cancer, talk less of somebody in my age group. I didn't even know that they do chemotherapy back in Cameroon, talk less of Bamenda. I, had, I, mean, I, had, I was born in Bamenda, raised in Bamenda, but I had no idea. So when I had these women reach out to me, you know, telling me they too had breast cancer, I had young girls reach out to me. I was like, wait, why are you based? And most of them were like, Mamenda, bingo, I, I'm doing my chemotherapy. I was really, I was, I was really surprised. So I took um, an interest in listening to their stories just to compare and see um, what was happening back home, you know, compared to what I, what I was going through. And it was day and night. First of all, these women were struggling to pay for their treatment. I did not struggle to pay for my treatment because of insurance. When I got diagnosed, I didn't think much about how am I going to pay for my chemotherapy. I didn't think that wasn't even an issue for me because I had a job. I had insurance that was taken care of. All I had to worry about was waking up and go do the treatment. But the girls back home, the women back home, all they needed from me was money to pay for treatment. So at the beginning, I started helping these women. I was paying for their treatments because I thought, okay, maybe just five women in Cameroon that have breast cancer. I can handle this. So I started taking care, you know, paying for chemotherapy. It was like a hundred thousand uh, for one session. I'll pay for it. Then they have to do surgery. I'll pay for it. And then there's more women. There's more and more. And then the treatment is not stopping. It's chemotherapy. It's surgery. And then they have like eight months to wait for their turn to do radiation. And during that period, they, they have malaria, they have typhoid. It, it was just one thing after another. And there were so many women. And then the one thing that shocked me was that most of the women were diagnosed um, with stage three or four and above. I, I, didn't, I didn't really see any stage one or stage two or zero. They were like stage four or, or five or above. And most of them, the pictures I was receiving from back home, like the, one of, some of the pictures Dr. Forma um, showed, there were women whose breasts had, I don't know, exploded. There were women with really large breasts. There were, the nipples were engorged. And it was, oh my goodness, it was, it was very trouble, troubling for me to see that this was happening back home and I had no idea. And the one thing that most of those women told me was, please don't tell anybody. I only have, only my mom knows and the doctors, my friends don't know, the relatives don't know, please do not share my story, just keep it, you know, between us and please just send me money for treatment. Mm -hmm. So I decided now to uh, create, to start the foundation Dare to Live with Angel. My main purpose was to create awareness on breast cancer back home because I lived, I grew up back home and I never, I didn't, I didn't hear much about breast cancer because I'm thinking maybe if I did, when I came here, I may have taken my breast um, screening more serious, but I did not know. I, I wasn't really exposed to, to breast cancer back home. So I created the foundation to um, create this awareness on breast cancer, especially amongst young women and then um, try to see how we could provide services and resources to patients and survivors back home, like pay for their treatments, give them things that um, they need during treatment, maybe water, pain medication. Most women who lose their hair during treatment, they like to wear weeks. We try to provide that um, for those women. And then also just inspire people, like no matter what you're going through, it could be cancer, it could be divorce, anything just hold your head up high pray trust the process just have hope and you know have faith trust your doctors and hopefully you know everything is going to go well we all are here for a purpose and for a time i don't think i'm going to leave forever i don't think that my cancer will never come back i don't want it to come back i don't want to i i you know but if it comes back then for me it is the will of god i'm going to do my best and whatever happens happens but for the time that I'm alive, I have to make 
the time that I have on earth purposeful. I have to live life to the full, enjoy life, be a good person and give back to the community. So um, we, we launched the foundation in 2019 and we've gone home every year. We've organized um, awareness talks in Bamenza, Yaoundé and Douala. For now, we are focused a lot in Douala and Yaoundé just because of the crisis in Bamenda and Boya. It makes it really hard for us to go there and, and do any, um, any events there. But we've done a lot of hospital visits. We've sent, um, I'm, I'm in talks with most of the main doctors at Mbingo in Bamenda General Hospital in Yaoundé and Douala. And I try to see what the needs of the patients are. Bamenda, bingo, the patients, the, of course, everybody needs treatment or finances to pay for treatment. They need um, blankets, they need soap, Bam um, Yawundi and Douala, pain medication um, and then finances for treatment. So we try to um, provide that, but our main focus is creating awareness. We want every woman in Cameroon to learn how to do their self-breast exams and do those exams religiously. If anyone in Cameroon has cancer, we want it to be stage zero, stage one, stage two, because that way your chances of, of survival are high. And then the treatment process is not as expensive as long, you know, as if um if you were diagnosed with stage four or five. I'm not a doctor. I, I work. I'm more in. Um, I'm, I work in a bank, so I don't know a lot about medicine. But I do know that if you're diagnosed with um stage one or stage three in Cameroon, I think it's going to be easier for you to afford um the the treatment. It's going to be shorter, and you may or may not even need to do radiation, um, chemotherapy. You know, and and it's hard for. I think just like one or two radiation machines back home. And it's hard to get on the line to um, to wait for your turn to do radiation. So our goal is to reach out to every woman in Cameroon. We went to Bachenga. It's a village in Yaoundé. We went there two weeks ago, and it was the first time that most of the women there were even hearing about breast cancer. We did their breast exams, and we had about 10 women that had issues with their breasts. The doctors felt, you know, lumps in their breasts. They could be benign or malignant, but um, we felt them and we've sent them to the hospital to do um, for that testing. So it is it is important for us that we, um, we reach out to all the women back home, do your breast exams. I did not do my breast exams because I always thought I can never have cancer. I don't know any, nobody in my family has it. So there's no way I can have it. I never took that serious. But because of the limited resources that we have back home in Cameroon, treatment process, the doctors and the know-how, it is on us, it is on us back home to, to, to be proactive and do the breast exams, the self-breast exams, um, just so that if there's anything, it's going to be caught early and your chances are high. So um, the Dare to Live um, Foundation, that's basically what we've been focusing on, creating this awareness, going back home, organizing these events, um, providing resources and services to patients and survivors. And we're starting to build workshops to where we're going to have um, survivors come in, we'll talk to them, share our stories, and then see how we can together um, try to inspire and help other um, patients or other women that are going through um, a similar situation back home. So um, like the, I think Elvis said, we are accepting any funds that anybody could have um, for our nonprofit. It, it, really, it will really help us in the work that we're doing. Like I said, at the beginning, I thought I could handle payment for, treat, for, um, for treatment, but it was just one lady after another, young girls, 25 year old, 30 year old, there's so many of them back home that are not telling people, they, they're not sharing their stories. Of course, there's a stigma back home. I remember when I got diagnosed with cancer, my, my relatives back home begged me not to share my story. They said, if I share my story, people are gonna know, people are gonna think it's witchcraft, people are gonna hate my family, nobody's gonna want to marry any woman in my family. They didn't want me sharing the story. So I, I, that's something similar that's happening back home, I think. That's why I, I don't think that the numbers that we have are, um, I don't think those are the true numbers. 
the women are not reporting um, what's actually going on, the doctors, and they're going to the hospital when they're like really advanced. Women back home, I don't think that if they feel any sharp pain, they're going to run to the hospital. They're going to leave it until it's something that they cannot manage. And when you do that, your chances of survival are really, really low. Um, that's my little boring story, but I am available for any questions that anyone is going to have um, as the, the workshop continues. So thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew, for this really, really exciting presentation. So really, really captivating images of your work. I mean, we can't stop seeing the slides. Um, so beautiful and just uh, a sum up of courage and resilience and uh, positive power of positive thinking and just how much your faith has helped you go through this. And uh, it's, it's, it's really a magical story. And I hope that all those who are, are here today will really, really, really be happy that they made the choice to be here today, uh, to be part of this session, to listen to someone who is sharing a life testimony of what she went through. And uh, listening to you, some, some of the things that caught my attention uh, were, ex I mean, just how you 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 were embarrassed by the news, considering that uh, you had never um, had anybody in the family who had cancer. You, you, it was interesting, you said, you, your BMI is okay, you are not obese, and you eat well. And uh, every average person follow, that listened to Muno's presentation and all the risk factors that Muno presented will know that you were okay not to bother about breast cancer because, of course, you are young. You're not even at that time. You are not even uh, within the age that Muno mentioned. That should be the age that we should start worrying about cancer. But then Muno made it clear that it's not exclusive. You can still have it at any age. So it's important to do a lot of different other tests, like a bracket test, which you didn't even know about. The fact that you could do that to see what your genetic predispositions were so but to have that kind of a news like a young girl maybe perhaps without a child yet at that point in time every other person would have given up to life um or take other uh, routes that maybe it could be devastating to your personal health but you stood strong and your story is that of resilience i must want to thank you so much Andrew, for accepting to share this story with us and for the amazing work you are doing with uh, the dare to live uh foundation and I, I hope that at the end of this uh, conversation you get a lot of calls from people who want to support uh, your work so once again thank you so much for uh, thank you and Mono for uh, this very very wonderful session and presentation at this point in time we shall be uh, diving directly into the question and answer session and usually what we do is if you have a question you can use the hand raise uh, symbol and just raise your hand so it can help us know that you have a question and uh, if you want to ask your question, we always want to know where you are uh, that tuning in from, just so we can know where our participants of today all came from. I see one of our moderators, Teresa, Teresa Nze is here with us. She is one of the moderators of the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. I'll give her the opportunity to go first. Teresa, take it from me. Hi, Elvis. Um, thank you so much for giving me the floor, sorry. I'm like busy, so I'm going to take my camera off. I was just turning it on so to say hi to everybody so that's they can not, see who's talking. The baby for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. So I'm so like happy Angel came in here to talk about breast cancer and everything because I believe like every single family has been touched. Like one person has, has, had, has had something to do with cancer. And thank you, Dr. Muno, for that fabulous presentation. Um, let me just go, go directly to my question. My question is to Dr. Foma. Um, um, so when you were doing your presentation, you spoke about fertility and all that. Uh, I want to know as a woman, if, okay, I diagnosed with cancer or something and I decide to freeze my eggs, right? If I freeze my eggs and I go through treatment and everything, can I do an IVF or do I need someone else to carry those eggs? Oh, very interesting question. Yes, you can do an IVF. So if you've ever gone, those who have never gone through a process of an IVF, in an IVF, the easiest part is harvesting the eggs. The most difficult part of an IVF is actually retaining a fetus that is going to become uh, generally a child later on. 
So if you've been pregnant prior, you've been pregnant before, most women who have been pregnant before have a higher chance of actually success rate than those who have not been pregnant before. So if you've been pregnant before, your chances are still very high. And um, in situations where you have multiple failures, then you may need a surrogate to help you. But freezing the eggs, if you are in uh, the US, you are in Europe, majority of your insurance, because you have cancer, they're going to cover that aspect of it because you're doing it for a therapeutic reason, really. So there are some states that have mandated that you, you, you're going to be able, even if you're not doing it for therapeutic, I'm just going to IVFs. Like New York, if you have certain good insurance, you'll be able to do it in case you have not, you're unable to have a child. That can be a good topic for another day. But fertility issues happen because once we give chemotherapy, the eggs are also cells that replicate very fast. So we tend to kill them. For men too, if you're going to get chemotherapy, majority of the time it's going to destroy also the sperm, but the germ cells are usually kept alive. So majority, just about 20% of people may get uh, important and they're unable to produce sex later on in life. So there are certain things that doctors can do in order to help you preserve fertility. And uh, we tend to get also high-risk gynecologists involved in this process. But one way is to actually do sperm preservation and egg banking and sperm banking in order to help these women. So never forget about this. Those who are less than 45 years old, once you're a cancer doctor, once we diagnose, we diagnose a lot of patients with testicular cancer who are young, and we need to talk to them about uh, preserving their sperms and uh, later on in the future so that they can be able to have kids. You know, we start by doing an orchiectomy. Women too who have ovarian cancer, women who have uh, any kind of cancer they have when they're young, they have leukemias, lymphomas, you wanna bring this option up to them. So uh, Therese, it's uh, doable, you can get pregnant. Now the aspect of uh, retaining the uh, pregnancy really depends on other factors that go with IVF too. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, response, Mono. And, uh, back home in Cameroon is a different story because fertility medicine, I, the good thing is that I studied in Cameroon. So, and I would allow, there are many other gynecologists here, Dr. Weban and the others will be able, and surgeons will be able to tell you what's happening. We have fertility uh, clinics in L'Hopital. There's one close to L'Hopital General, which I know. There are others in Douala who are doing it. But the access is a problem, finance is a problem, techniques, difficulties in uh, doing the same techniques we do here, access to medications and uh, also harvesting and banking. It's a big problem. So, and majority of those who are doing that, nobody even thinks about this when you have cancer, they start thinking about trying to get rid of the cancer, which we are actually limited because we don't even work as teams back home, no tumor boards. And uh, I would really be willing in the future or any time to be involved. If someone wants me to join their tumor board or less for us to create one, I'm very willing to participate in any form of a tumor board back home. And I think it's something which is going to be wonderful. Thank you very much, Mona. Question, do we have a spam or egg bank in Cameroon? So there is, I think there is egg, egg banking. I don't know exactly how the process is done, but the, the, I don't know exactly where it's done, but there is in vitro fertilization that is done back home. And I will need to talk to the gynecologists who are now here, some of them, what is done? Is it just done uh, accurately or they can, they can be able to bank, do some banking and preserve cryopreservations? So I need to really find out from them, really. Uh -huh. Yeah, Thank you so much. That. And I think someone, anyone who is here can actually chip in and let us know. But I know we have centers that uh, do fet offer fertility treatment. Back okay. home. Success okay. rate, very low, but we do have centers. We're making progress. We're making progress. At first, we never had any, and now we do have some, so there is hope. So let's bring in Germaine Bange to ask uh, the question. Of course, let us know where you're dialing in from, and then your question. Jemen. Jemen, if you are speaking, then you are mute. You might have to unmute. Okay, if we cannot get Jemen, uh, maybe let us uh, bring in Sase. Hello, everyone. Uh, 
I'm dialing from Netherlands. And uh, my first question is a continuation of the previous question. Um, I wanted to ask, is there a possibility of reintroducing the cancer in the case where you preserve your egg or your sperm and then it's been, um, I don't know, like placed back or like in the case of um, IVF? That's the first question. The second question, I'm um, sorry I died in a bit late. I wanted to ask the presenter about um, the, like, is there a risk, uh, is there a high risk of um, to people of the following classes, like people who have children at later age, one, or people who have children at earlier age, or uh, people with without children, like, women without children more at risk? That's the second question. Thank you very much. It was a very um, interesting and helpful presentation. Thank you so much, Sase. And uh, I want Muno to answer this question before we take the next question. Muno? Yeah, so Elvis, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so what is important is that actually the first question, the risk of breast cancer, let me go to breast cancer for reintroducing the egg, no. The question is the hormonal treatments that we may give you during this process may increase your risk of developing breast cancer. Because in the process of trying to do in vitro fertilization, we do have to do certain, give certain hormonal treatments and keep the environment in such a way that the egg will be able to implant itself. So that process itself may increase, but the risk is very low. It's quite negligible really, but the egg itself or the sperm itself does not increase your risk of breast cancer. But medications that we may give may actually help proliferate because as I told you, some of the cancer are oestrogen positive and progesterone positive. So they may feed the cancer cells in some situations. But statistically and from clinical trials we have had, there have been no statistical significant difference with women who have had um, uh, in vitro fertilization after having breast cancer, developing cancers. Now going into the second part of your question, having a child. So once you, once you are pregnant or once you, uh, once you give birth in an, in an, in an, in an, in an, in an old, in an elderly age, your chances of breast cancer actually increases. Not breastfeeding also often can increase your chances of breast cancer, but the, 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 the magnitude of it is really very low. Having a child in, when you're old also can increase your chances of uh, the incidence of breast cancer actually, having a child actually decreases your incidence of breast cancer really. So then if you have your menses very early or you have your menses and your menopause very late, your chances of breast cancer increases. Use of hormone replacement therapy to treat menopause may also increase your breast cancer. So there are several other things that can do that, but the dynamics is pretty, but the magnitude is also very low. So it's important that you know that. It's not, we're really talking about magnitude of some of these risk factors. Some of them are really, really high. Others are just, uh, you tend to see the risk of it partially. Mona, just to follow up, what is it in breastfeeding that minimizes the risk of breast cancer in a way that a layman can understand? So during that period, women do not have, uh, they, there's just exposure to estrogen and progesterone, that's really what happens. So you are not actually ovulating the amount, your hormones are being well controlled, you're not having Oestrogen levels and progesterone levels are regulated in such a way that the cells are not being fed, the cancer cells, during that period. So there are some protective hormones that are actually protecting you during that time. Oxytocin is being produced and uh, other hormones, while the hormones that help make you have your cycles are not there, your oestrogen and progesterone spikes. That's, that's very good. And I hope that clears the air for men who thought they could replace babies by sucking breasts to prevent cancer. Thank you. 
<laughs> so All right. that is that is an interesting that's yeah, a, because that's uh, why the question can men now so help women to we, stop the breast to help prevent breast cancer so you just cleared the air to say it's an issue of hormones not so not uh yeah it's the issue of the aspect of you sucking the breast actually stimulates some of those hormones and the important thing is that if you think that is a practice you're going to do in order to drastically reduce breast cancer no Okay, if you looked at the slide I showed you, breast cancer is one of those cancers that uh, primary prevention is really, 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 really rare in order to prevent certain things. Even they ask us, or we talk about obesity, but it plays a very little factor in breast cancer. Nutrition, it's a risk factor, but the magnitude is really low. We do have a weight gain, a risk factor, but the magnitude is very low. Things that really play a big part, your genetics, the fact that you have BRCA genes increases your, your chances by tenfold. The chance that you have uh, Lee Famini genetics increases your chances. If your dad had prostate cancer, you most likely, and your uncles, you may have BRCA2, someone with pancreatic cancer. If you do, just the fact that you're a woman increases your chances. Just the fact that you're aging increases your chances. So <laughs> getting to the point of, there are certain things that you do in medicine, you want to know what the magnitude is, because by advocating for that, later on, many women will have breast cancer and they'll tell you, oh, I did get my man do breastfeeding every day, but I still had breast cancer. But really, the chances of it reducing it in a big way is very low. So that's you need that's to, that's yeah. That's, that saves the main. Thank you so much. But uh, before I bring in uh, Frida, M -O -M uh, no, I we had uh, Happy Gladys, whose hands was up, if she's still available. But <laughs> let me just get back to uh, Anjo. Anjo, please let me know in your campaign, what is the involvement of men in, as far as your campaign of breast cancer awareness is concerned? How far do you uh, go to involve men? And uh, I come back, we have cleared the air about uh, sucking of the breast, but now let's come back. Men still touch the breast. Can they help women in breast examination? Can husbands help their wife in examining their breasts? Because I think they go there too often. Um. Yes, actually. You know, like, <laughs> um, I remember a doctor in Dwala once said that if you're a married woman and you are diagnosed with breast cancer and you have a lump that's like really big, then it means your husband was not doing his job because if he was doing his job, he would have noticed that something is wrong with your boobs. So the, the role that men husbands can play with helping their, with helping women detect um, breast cancer is don't just go there just for pleasure. I mean, go for pleasure, but also try to make it um let let something good come out of that. So while you're touching the breast, if you feel anything different in your wife's breast, because men. Touch, I, I think they touch their wife's breast more often than the women. Mm -hmm. so you're always touching the breast. You're always looking at it. If there's any little change that you see, try to tell your wife about it. Just, just don't um, ignore. So husbands really have a big, they know they, they know the breast, the way it looks. They can tell like, hey, that nipple is looking that way. This is different. If I feel something here, you know. So men, husbands, speak up if you notice anything different with your wife's um, breast. But when we go for our screenings, the men that are there, we do screen them also. I remember, um, I think two years ago, Beyonce's dad came out that um, he had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Maybe I think it was stage one or two, I have to look that up, it was early stage. But men can um, also um, have breast cancer. So we always screen them. We, um, we have a lot of volunteers that are male, which is a good thing. And we tell them when you go back, talk to your wives, your girlfriends, your sisters, your mom, educate them about breast cancer. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, I hope the men in the house uh, have heard you and the role we can all play to help our spouses. And uh, thank you so much for that. We'll bring in Gladys Happy now to ask that question. Hi, Gladys. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, sorry about earlier. I was trying to unmute. <laughs> I couldn't, I was driving. But thank you for giving me um, the floor. I just want to thank all the presenters for being awesome. Um, I I thank the, the lady who just spoke. Is that I, uh, Raisa or I can't, I, the, the I, testimony? 
Yeah, Angel is the one. And please tell us where, you're Angel, yeah. where are you dialing in Angel. from? Just so that others um, know. Oh, yeah, I'm dialing from Maryland, Maryland in the USA. Um, yeah, so I wanted to just uh, thank um, Angel for sharing her story and tell her that uh, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of hope with breast cancer. Um, my personal story was with my mother who was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1996. She was actually diagnosed in Cameroon. So um, very interesting case. Um, and uh, <clears throat> well, went to the lab in Cameroon for some reason. Uh, no, actually she went to her doctor. He thought it was a cyst. And he went to the lab and we were fortunate that one of my uncles had a lab in Douala. Um, so he retested the sample and because my mom was put on antibiotic, mind you, for having a cyst. They thought it was a cyst. Um, so um, she had uh, a biopsy done in Cameroon and uh, the lab got it wrong the first time. Then my uncle tested it again and saw that it was something very bizarre happening. This is back, this is 96. So we had the opportunity to send it to France right away. Then we got this call saying she needs to come right away. It is cancer. Um, it was very, it's a, it was very tough time in my life because I was actually in nursing school in the US attending University of Maryland and I'm thinking oh my goodness I'm learning all this thing about cancer and then yet yeah, it's now it's happening in my family um, um my mom is a cancer survivor <laughs> thank god uh, she she made it through she was stage three um I, I've been very close to the breast cancer fight I mean I want to say fight, awareness I want to say um it's definitely there if your mother, for example, my mother was diagnosed at 44. That was in 1996. She was 44 years old. I talked to my primary care doctor here, um, and uh, we decided that you subtract. I don't know if it's still the rule, Dr. Moon, you can tell us. Uh, we subtracted minus 10, and I started getting um, mammogram since I was 34. I, I don't know if it's still the rule now, but... Um, yeah, I uh, like I said, my mom is doing great. She does her mammogram; it's been good since '97. She she's been doing well, and uh, my sister and I, we just know we high risk. We have to keep testing. I did not I did not do the BRCA for a specific reason because back in the late '90s, uh, my doctor told me there's no need to know this if you know you're not gonna have a total hysterectomy and a mastectomy. So I didn't do it. <laughs> I mean, I have two children now. Um, it wasn't for those reasons. It's just at that time they were saying, I don't know if it's still the same thing. They were saying, what is the point of knowing if you're not gonna have those surgeries? Um, yeah, hopefully I don't have the genes. I'm still thinking about testing, <laughs> but I do my mammogram every year and I'm actually due this month. So it's good that I saw this, I'm due this month. I purposely schedule it to be on in October every year to do the mammogram. My sister and I and my mom, we do it. So I just want to say, share my story and thank all the presenters and all the education. I'm a nurse practitioner, so I do breast exam too. And I always tell women, just like you say, Elvis, it's important, tell your husband, Fill your breasts every month, a few days after your period, though. That's something I wanted to add. You have to tell women to check their breasts a few days after their period, because if you do it before your period, you're going through all these hormonal changes. You might feel something that's not very accurate. So do it after your period, a few days, three to five days. That's my uh, take on that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gladys, for uh, your story. Of course, 26 years ago, mom is still alive that adds to the story of hope and uh, resilience that Angel presented to us and to say that there's no need to be afraid to do the test even yeah. there's no need to be too scared to say you've been diagnosed of cancer we have testimonies of people that are alive and uh, we want to encourage everybody to join the fight and to help us continue to raise awareness glad is happy is a member of uh a very uh, powerful uh, group of women in Maryland. Uh, they call themselves um, uh, Cameroon uh, 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 Nurse Association of Maryland. Um, they, they all do a lot of work back home. I've uh, had a session with them. I've had a video conference call with them and to 
uh, it's, it's amazing some of the work that they are doing to uh, promote uh, healthcare back home. So thank you so much, Gladys, for the work you are doing and for sharing your testimony with us. At this point, we would want to bring in uh, Breeze jo uh, Jobe to ask. Uh, Gladys, let me just reflect on some few things uh, Gladys asked. Sure. Yeah, sure. Just two minutes, I just want to answer them. Yes, uh, for the sake of, for if you have a first degree relative who is diagnosed with breast cancer, you want to do your screening 10 years uh, earlier to the time they were actually diagnosed. If they were the age of 35, which one, one ever comes first? Secondly, I would advise if you are having multiple family members, there is genetic counseling that is done here in the US and in Europe and many other countries. And you need to do the BRCA test. The reason why it's important to do it is just that it's associated to other cancers. There's not only the BRCA, now we do multiple other gene testing. So it's a multiple gene panel, and it's going to help you really guide your future better. Meaning you're going to know your risk for prostate cancer in your sons. You will know the risk for ovarian cancer, which is also associated. You will know the risk for pancreatic cancer, not only breast cancer. And uh, in situations, you can make certain decisions in order to reduce your risk and your likelihood. And it depends how many other genes you do have. So those things can be calculated elders. So it's something that I do advocate, not just to go do a 21 genetic me, me and you, but there are specific genes that are done when you're canceled. Thank you very much uh, for adding uh, those details. It's helpful. For those who have asked their question, please, you might want to raise your uh, uh, your hand down just so you can help me know those who are still to ask their questions. Uh, did I bring in Frida already? No, not yet. Oh, Frida, take it away from me. <laughs> All right, I'm uh, Frida from uh, Cameroon, Kumba, precisely. Correct. Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Akwi, for your testimony. Um, my question is, with respect to breast cancer treatment, what is the role of supplements? Because recently we've had patients diagnosed with cancer, placed on chemo or radiotherapy, and they abandoned, they stopped chemo or stopped radiation and started some supplements, in quotes. And most of these supplements come from the Philippines. An example is to life and cell GVT that is made of glutathione. In uh, what's your experience with supplements in the management of cancer patients? Does it really work? Because uh, there's a lot of questions coming up with respect to that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very important question. And I hope, Mono, you should be ready to fight a war with network marketers, but be sincere. What is the role of uh, you know, supplements? So overall, the role of uh, supplements, so supplements are multiple things. Depends on what you're supplementing, but to treat cancer, the role, there is no role. And it depends what supplement we're dealing with. So most of them are high marketing scams. And once you market them as supplements in the US, I'll take the US and I'll take Europe. If you market them as supplements, not as medications, FDA doesn't regulate them. That's why you see them proliferate in, in the market. And whatever they write there, they have no justification to justify what they are written. So those things are considered like food, and most of them do not actually provide the benefits that they say or they write on it. So in order to treat cancer, there is a rigorous process in place. We do clinical trials, and we are able to tell if something works or not. But someone could be taking iron. They have, they have let's say, gas, um, uh, colon cancer, they are iron deficient, and it's helping them in, re in, in actually fortifying the iron levels, which could be a supplement. They could be vitamin D deficient, they could have zinc deficiency. Those are all different things, may make them feel better. But in treating the cancer itself, there are several treatment algorithms out there. I'm talking as from the point of a physician, most of the supplements are scams. The good thing about the human body is that your brain controls your body. So each time you feel fine psychologically, it translates into your body also feeling better generally because never forget that you have an immune system 
And I'll tell you something amazing. Your immune system treats multiple cancers every day. So what we do with immunotherapy is we're, in, we're, we're using your immune system in order to kill cancer cells. That's what your immune system does. In your body, there are certain cells. When you hear about HIV, when patients have HIV, they develop cancers, don't they? And they develop infections. Do you know why they develop cancers? Is because their CD4 cells and CD8 cells go low. Those cells are the generals in the body and they're responsible to coordinate for you to kill cells that are developing cancer cells that are developing and you are not able to do that. So your immune system in itself is able to do that and your mind controls your body. So people who have good mindset could actually help themselves fight cancer in several ways, but it's how to enhance this process that is a bit difficult. But what I want to say is that totally disagree with food supplementation in order as a modality to cancer. These are the modalities to treat cancer that we know about. Several research is going on on several other food supplements. If you think a food supplement can cure cancer, then we can actually run a clinical trial. We do have immunotherapy, which is the new guy in the house, where we use your immune system to kill cancer. All right. Majority of the time, the side effects are very, very low, but we do have certain prominent side effects that I can discuss with those who are taking it. We do have targeted therapy. It's like looking at the weakest point of that cancer and targeting it. There are several targets. Most of them are genetic targets. Most of them are pathways in metabolic activities. They have fewer side effects and we are able to control cancer very well. We do have chemotherapy. It's acting at the level of the cell cycle. Majority of them have huge side effects. And a lot of people do not tolerate them, but we have ways. If you are unable to administer chemotherapy properly, then you kill the patient from the chemotherapy itself. And that's what is happening in most cases. And I have an aunt who told me one thing, she died of colon cancer, it's very sad. And when I told her to go to L'Hopital General for treatment, someone opted to do surgery on her for some reason when she had metastatic disease. She told me everybody that goes there dies. It could be that they're dying of the cancer, but it could be that we're actually killing them. And you should not, hospitals should not be an area where you're killing patients because if you're giving someone cisplatinum, I have another patient that I was called a month ago. She got cisplatinum and swore that she's never gonna get any kind of chemotherapy again in L'Hopital Santa. Why? They gave her cisplatinum, nobody controlled the vomiting. They have the worst form of vomiting that can happen on earth. So you need medications to control. You need to hydrate those patients. You need to control their counts. You need to do blood work frequently. So chemotherapy is not just the fact that you can give chemotherapy, that you give chemotherapy. Majority of patients who are dying of cancers are dying of the treatment itself because they cannot give it properly. We don't have nurses that are trained and chemotherapy specialized trained nurses. It's not because you can give drugs that you just give them. At times you're doing more harm than good. We do have other things called hormonal therapies for cancers that are hormone sensitive. An example of a hormone sensitive cancer is breast cancer. Almost about 60% of them are progesterone and, and, and estrogen positive, and they are easy drugs to take. Tamoxifen, uh, azemestine, there are several of them. I'm just not gonna list all just a few. Then we do have, even for prostate cancer now, it's just majority of patients are gonna respond very well to hormonal castration or you could even do an okectomy in the first line, but there are several other drugs that we do, abiraterone and all those other drugs. We also do have radiation therapy, which works very well in cancer that is localized. That's where I always, I would love to always hear from gynecologists and surgeons back home, the choice of a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy. Because I, our pathologists back home able to tell you guys that your, 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 post lumpectomy if your margins are negative. Are they able, are you able to get your patients to get radiation? Because lumpectomy without radiation is not as good as mastectomy. We know those clinical trials. Lumpectomy where the margins are not negative, it's something you need to talk about those things. So when we do some of these things, are we able to really guarantee these patients that we're doing good or bad? At times, I don't want to cut a woman's breast, all of it. But if I have women that will not even have adequate radiation and they're going to have reoccurrence, these are all ethical things that we should talk about. 
So there are several modalities. Only talking about immunotherapy, we could have a lecture for like a week on this platform. Different That's kinds right. of immunotherapies. We can have a lecture for a week, different kinds of chemotherapy. So it's something we can talk passionately about for months and weeks. That, that's very true, Mamuna, and uh, you said it. Uh, one of the laws of ethics is that even if you cannot do good, do no harm. One of the strong laws of ethics is even if you cannot do good, please do no harm. So our choices should always be weighed at the backdrop of this ethical consideration. And you mentioned that our immune system plays a very important role in even killing some of the cancer cells. And that's testimony of what Andrew said. And I quote, no matter the problem you're going through, trust the process and listen to the doctors and remain positive, which means her mindset played a very important role in her fight against cancer. And which brings me to the point and the role that some of the people we might consider as bad are playing, which rather if instead of, uh, sending them away or speaking negatively about the work they are doing, how can we integrate them into the process and get them to get the education? For example, let's come to the fit uh, prosperity gospel people who have actually caused some cancer patient to abandon treatment for the promise that Jesus is going to heal their cancer. And it plays a very important role because some of these patients uh, at the point in their life where all the need is just that mindset and to and believe that they can live once again. And so if these religious people can help give them that hope and then allow them to stay on their medication, then that will be double treatment. It means the religious people are giving them the immunity based on their mindset and reducing their stress and building, improving on their immunity, just like you've mentioned. And they are taking their medication that is actually doing the work that we want to do. So if, they, if we look at medicine in a holistic approach and look at what each actor is doing and ask the question, what is it good that we can take from what these actors are doing and how can we integrate it into the process to give a better outcome? That's what holistic medicine is all about. If we go to all those who are selling the network marketing and their language of communication, and we see that they have some ability to communicate more than us, the clinician, to tell the patients about their health, then how can we bring them in such a way that they can tell the patient, please, these are supplements. They are helpful in restoring this, but trust your cancer medication, never go away from it because that is the major thing. And then you will still bring them into the process without sending them away and saying what they are doing is wrong. And that is what holistic medicine is, is all about. Even the tradi practitioners, if there is a traditional healer who claims that cures cancer, like we saw some of them go on uh, uh, they, 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 in buses and say they have medication that treat 200 disease, if whatever they do can improve the mindset of the people they are preaching to, the question is how can we incorporate them to make sure that they preach what is right about cancer treatment in as much as they have a product they want to market, which we don't know whether it works or not, it does not work, but we want our patient to stay on treatment. So I think that is my thoughts about holistic medicine and the kind of things that we should be doing um, in every aspect of our disease that we are struggling to to look for treatment. I remember when HIV started, many people, uh, the equation was HIV is equal to death. And that equation is what killed so many people more than the virus. And anybody that had HIV knew, okay, the outcome was dead and nobody trusted that there could be another solution. So um, we would bring in, I think Brian's hand is, have, have we had Germain already? Germain? No, we haven't had Germain already. All right. My, I had, I had you can come no. in. My mind. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation, Dr. Muno and Ms. Akri. I am a medical student, CPA, in the Faculty of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences in Yaoundé. So I have three questions. Um, as concerning the management of breast cancer, I would like to find out um, if, as general practitioners, are we authorized to prescribe tamoxifen and uh, where does our role end at the level of the management for us to give to the specialist, either the oncologist or the surgeon? And then my second question is, I'd like to ask, what's the survival rate for triple negative breast cancer? Like, because um, during the presentation, if I heard clearly, I heard the prognosis of triple negative 
breast cancer, it's not, it's, it's not good. And my third question is, um, I would like to also ask about the relationship. Uh, how does colorectal cancer relate to breast cancer? So like the past medical history in the patient when interrogating the patient. So that's the questions I have. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Germain, for those brilliant questions. So the first one, if you are allowed to prescribe tamoxifen, I would say no, okay? And the reason why is because you cannot prescribe a medication where you are unable to provide the diagnosis for that patient. Tamoxifen is not just any medication that you should prescribe like that, okay? The tamoxifen has side effects that you have to know those side effects. You have to understand that it increases your risk for uterine cancer. There is risk for bone pain. There are several things you can cause to this patient drastically. No tissue, no issue. If you have a patient who has done a biopsy and you don't even know what the progesterone level is or what the estrogen level is, why on earth are you giving them tamoxifen for? You don't just get up blindly and give patients medications. So I'm going to say, and majority even of oncology patients even allow it for your gynecologist in Cameroon setting and your surgeons, breast surgeons to do that. And your oncologist, now you have a residency program in medical oncology. They are, should be the one asking me these detailed questions. How do you even prescribe tamoxifen? When do we use tamoxifen for prevention? What are the patients with LCIS who qualify for tamoxifen, DCIS who qualify for tamoxifen as prevention measures? How do we use tamoxifen in post-diagnostic breast cancer? How many years are we going to give them tamoxifen? Do we give tamoxifen to everybody? Do we give examestin? Do we give anastrozole? Postmenopausal, how do we transition? These are all complex questions that you need to be educated well about. But if you have worked in a sub, there are systems where we do train in cases where we lack specialists, but Cameroon doesn't lack the specialists and gynecologists to train who can be able to answer these questions. The problem is that most of the time our tissues are not sent for pathology. Even when they are sent for pathology, specific pathologies are not done. If you get what Gladys said, they had to send it to France. I have sent multiple samples to France in order to answer basic questions or central pasteur, basic estrogen and progesterone status that I need. It's not, it's, it was not a luxury. It's I need it for every breast cancer to treat them. I cannot just go blindly and giving patient medications that would actually cause more cancer when they don't need it. Just take, for example, a woman is triple negative breast cancer and you do a biopsy and they tell you it's breast cancer, they don't do the hormonal level and I put them on tamoxifen. And later on, they develop on top of that, the breast, they develop over they, or develop uterine cancer. So what am I doing? I'm killing them. So I want to tell you, you cannot prescribe a medication that you're unable to understand the side effects and you're unable to make the diagnosis of that patient. So I think at the level of education that we have, it's not geared for general practitioners to do that, but we have a lot of gynecologists in the house. Gyne oncologists, there are few of them, but the gynecologists can actually do that because they have the capacity to read and understand that, even the surgeons. <clears throat> now, going into your second question, life expectancy. Triple negative breast cancer has the worst expectancy. It depends what stage. So stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. That's why those things are staged that way. So life expectancy, if someone had triple negative breast cancer, it's about 23. Uh, so it's, it depends really from the time of diagnosis to when you have metastatic disease, it's like 23 months, but it's improving. Metastatic disease is stage four. So it's improving because we're getting better treatment. Just last month, we had multiple FDA approvals for multiple drugs. Now we no longer even triple negative breast cancer is going to be reclassified in new textbooks. The real triple negatives will be few of them. So those who were diagnosed initially as triple negative, a lot of them are HER2 low because there is new treatment for HER2 breast cancer with low HER2. So there is a new medication that was approved. Now we're going to go reclassify all those patients as so that we can be able to give them this new medication called transtuzumab duroxetine. It's called TDXD. So majority of those who are triple negative, only about 10% of them will stay triple negative. The other ones will become hard to low patients. 
they will no longer be triple negative. So cancer and oncology is evolving in a rapid way you can never imagine. So you need to really subspecialize and be able to understand what is happening. But colon cancer, on the other hand, the genetic risk for colon cancer and breast cancer, there are some few syndromes, like Lee Framini, push jagger syndromes that you can have cancer in multiple areas, multiple organs, and the colon can be one of them. But the BRCA gene doesn't really increase your chances of you having colon cancer, which are the big ones. The PAR B2 does not, PAR B1 does not, BRCA1, BRCA2 do not. But colon cancer has its own familiar genes. Okay, familiar adenopolyposis, there are multiple genetic families that you see, everyone has colon cancer. So when you're screening and you're a student and you're taking history and someone tells you my grandfather had colon cancer, my great grandfather had colon cancer, you start seeing that kind of history, think about other genes. So there are multiple genes for colon cancer. Colon cancer is a more difficult cancer to treat than breast cancer. You have to be able Raisa was here. I don't know if she's still here. She was a gastroenterologist back home. You have to screen them by doing colonoscopy. That'll be a discussion for another. I think Dr. Zita talked about that. You have to be able to do colonoscopy and uh, be available. And here in the US and other places, colonoscopy, we do it for everyone above 45. And it's a sad thing to tell you guys all in the, all here in the town hall, being black, you are more at risk for colon cancer than being Caucasian. So any black guy I see in the hospital who is anemic, severely anemic, highest iron deficiency anemia, I usually tell my residents the patient has colon cancer and I'm always right 90% of the time, 90. So we are even thinking about screening black, especially black men at the age of 40. Just our genetics is a big problem for colon. Even women too, triple negative is showing more commonly in, the breast cancer overall occurs equally among the group, but triple negative is showing more in black women too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mona. And uh, it's sad. Uh, black people already have a lot in their plate and I uh, don't know why everything comes to <laughs> be against us, but um, that's just important to note that just being black already predisposes you even more. So we'll bring in Brian, whose hand has been up. Brian. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elvis. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, and I think, uh, thanks also, Dr. Mona, for that feedback. I'm really glad we had someone like Jermaine, who is a medical student, talk about, uh, ask this question. I think that was really important. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Mona, how can we, what can we do to raise awareness? I mean, so I think one of the challenges I think we have in Africa and, and maybe in Cameroon in particular is just how, uh, how few uh, experts there are, like how many uh, gynecologic um, oncologists do we have? There are very few, even cytopathologists. We are talking about even access to uh, testing for this uh, prestogen uh, addressed around uh, receptors and having to send samples to France. And, and that's really terrible. If we had some of those diagnostic capabilities down at uh, home, I think that's really going to be helpful. But I'm wondering what can we do to um, improve or increase interest in the field, so we have more students who are interested in becoming, uh, who are interested in cancer in general oncology. Um, I, I know we have a residency program in Cameroon, but I'm wondering, you know, where, where are those, you know, people going to? Uh, do we have more people getting into this field? How can we, um, how can we increase the um, number? Uh, probably, you know, palliative nurses and. Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, geriatric people, you re really take care of patients with those kinds of conditions and um, how do we increase even access to some of the imaging, you know, technologies. I, I think currently in Cameroon, we probably only have, I think, two centers or one with an MRI. So I think uh, that's one place we have to go because I think, um, and uh, Akri talked about this, we, you know, we, we uh, you know, doing self-exam by yourself is helpful. You, Kind of increases the amount of you know false you know positives as well. So I think um, um, you know we could have many many cases, many people with maybe the disease. But the question is the delay, the time between being diagnosed or maybe you you've noticed a lump, and the time you actually meet an expert could be extremely long. 
And also, if you don't even have the money, I think Akri also talked about the fact that she's been supporting people financially um, to get you know, access to therapy and, and, things, uh, and things. So I think we also have a problem with, you know, we have people being diagnosed, but look at the time, the time to find an expert, to find um, an expert, to even have access to someone. It could maybe take months, it could take forever. So I'm just thinking what can be done to really boost interest in the field and have more people interested in this so we can, you know, not have these kinds of uh, deficits we have in, in, uh, in this particular uh, specialty, um, Dr. Mona. Yeah, Brian, thank you very much. It's one of those, uh, um, you're just made my day sad by your series of questions. Well, I'm not sad because even I'm going to start with the core of the problem. Even if we train them, are we going to be able to retain them? Okay. Even if we train them, are we going to be able to retain them? If you can imagine the number of doctors and physicians that Q's trained who are found in the US, but we are trained who are now here. Bamenda is training who will be moving here. Um, uh, University de Montaigne and everything. <laughs> You will not believe that we can train as much as we want. We will not be able to retain them if we don't change the way we treat this qualified health personnel. A specialized nurse who is a psychiatric nurse, are we going to be able to retain them? Are we going to be able to retain the palliative care nurses if we still, if physicians, nurses, laboratory technicians are unable to put bread on the table and feed their families? in a country where we have. I'm going to start by that. So training is good, but we need to learn to retain those we have at the moment. We need to have policies in place to retain them. Now, going back into training, every medical system trains physicians based on uh, what their primary healthcare problem is, and they gear it towards that. I think we're having this transition that you talk about all the time. There's epidemiological transition going on and we need to adapt our training based on that. So we need to start by making sure that these medical students get introduced into the most common cancers, they get the right lectures, they get the right things that they have to do. So their interest in the future is going to be geared towards those things. If we're doing specialization, we should be able to adapt our specialization cycles to be able to train the specialist, not just because you want to get up one morning and said, I trained an oncologist. You don't want to train an oncologist who is going to be unable to, you want to make the facilities able to train those people there. They should be able to have exposure to that. Is the model we have right now the right model by just training them out of school for three years or four years? Is that the right model? Do we have the right facilities to train them? Those are all questions we should ask ourselves. I really am an advocate of us training, but I'm an advocate of us giving quality and quantity while we're training. And uh, which people do you need in order for a tumor, for, a, for an oncologist to work? Do we have the right radiologist training? Do we have interventional radiologists? How do we get tissue in the first place? Tissue is a big problem in Cameroon. Just getting tissue. We will be unable to diagnose any lung cancer if we don't have cardiothoracic surgeons, we don't have interventional radiologists who can go in and diagnose and pick out that tissue. Breast is a bit in the outside. Now, are we able to train pathologists that will be able to analyze those tissues and tell us what is really going on? No tissue, no oncology. There are only four cancers that you can treat without a tissue. No tissue, no oncology. Meaning that it's an advanced specialty that actually took its roots in the 70s in the US. There were many people talking about oncology before. That's why it's called hematology and oncology because all of them were hematologists that branched into oncology. Reason is because without tissue, you cannot really treat a cancer because the treatments are different. Without a biopsy, squamous cell carcinoma is different from adenocarcinoma, is different from small cell lung cancer in the lung. They have three different treatments. And just going by giving someone chemotherapy because they have a mass in the lung and you don't even know what it is, is sad. Now, why do we have tumor boards? Because we have people that have to integrate their knowledge together. In Cameroon, collaboration becomes a problem. I know there are surgeons in L'Hopital Central who have always wanted to have tumor boards with colorectal cancer with their oncologists, but none of them have ever joined. You cannot do that 
and be able to treat your patients properly. Surgeons may do the best surgery, they go over to chemotherapy and die from chemotherapy. They may do the best chemotherapy and the patients are unable to get the right surgery that they need. We need interdisciplinary rounds. We need to keep our pride away. We need to talk with each other and know that we are in this together. Elvis, I know we have gotten into your time and your time conscious, but all what I want to say is that, Brian, in the parking lot, we'll talk more about this. It's really a developing world problem. Yeah. Oncology is a field that you need to put your act together. You need to get organized even when you're poor, like in Kigali, and then you'll be able to handle things. Thank you very it's just much. just a disease not for the poor man. And we are poor, so we have to organize ourselves in poverty and do the best of uh, efforts in organizing the little resources we have for the best of outcome. Thank you so much, Mono, for uh, I mean those uh, very brilliant responses that you provided. Um, I want to ask the last set of questions to uh, Akwi before we wrap up the session and get some few time for the uh, parking lot. Akwi, please, I would like to know from you, what are some of the major challenges you've encountered doing this amazing work you are doing in Cameroon? Yeah, you're muted. I'm so sorry. I think the main um, thing that we, the issue that we have is finances. When we want to organize these events back home, it doesn't even matter if you want to use a hall or um, just a big empty space. Everybody back home needs money. They want us to bribe them. They want us to give them money to do these events. And it's free events. We're not taxing people. We're not asking people to pay money to come for us to do their screening. It's free screening. It's free events. But I think the finance situation back home just makes it really hard for us to, you know, have access to uh, the spaces that we need to use. You want to go to the hospital to don to make a donation, and not all, but the doctors, the nurses, they need something for themselves too. So you have to put money aside to give the doctors before you go to make donations to the patients. So it makes working back home a little bit hard, and then uh, the patients back home. They, my, my story is one of, you know, hope and, and just inspiration, but back home, the women, the patients, they just need the money. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. We know you're, you know, you're strong. You have to fail. You have to hope, but please, what I need right now is money for treatment. So that's what we, we need to use a lot of funds to help um, the patients back home be able to afford um, their treatment. So I think it's on, on, on a big scale, it's really the finance, both for what the patients need and just for us to be able to carry out our work efficiently. What level of support do you have from the Ministry of Public Health, if I may ask? Um, public health, none. But um, this year, the National Cancer, I think the NCCC, National Cancer Community, Community in Cameroon has reached out to us. So um, that's a really good thing. And I want to sponsor the walk for Yaoundé this year. So um, that has taken off a big load off of us. And I think with their support and maybe when other big organizations or when the Ministry of Public Health sees um, us through them, we may be able to leverage um, more help and be able to do um, what we have to do. So. The, yeah, the National Cancer Committee is on board. And um, I think that's the beginning of, of, of bigger things to come. Yeah, but we intend to try to reach out to a lot of this, the Ministry of um, Public Health, most of the hospitals back home and see how we can all collaborate. Because if, if it's one voice, one big voice, we're gonna reach um, a, a lot more people than everybody trying to do something little in their corners. But if we all come together, we can do a lot of work back home. That's exciting. And we understand that finance is a major issue and uh, collaboration that you need from the stakeholders back home and just uh, uh, some of those bottlenecks that make your work difficult. Right here, right now, there are some people who have listened to you and who are really interested in just getting to support your work directly. And uh, I know they can reach you. Um, please, while we are doing the summary of this session, we'll be glad if you can put your contact in the chat and your and any means that they can reach you. And of course, the town hall has already made a pledge to, to uh, through our chair to support you with the sum of $500 for your work. And uh, we do hope that uh, we are going to use this platform as much as we can to uh, showcase the work you are doing. 
Uh, we might have just been 50 that tune in uh, online actively during this session, but you can trust me that uh, when this session ends, we always edit and uh, host it on our YouTube channel. And when we check on the analytics from Facebook to YouTube uh, uh, views and other ways in which people get to view the recordings of this session, we see that each session is viewed by averagely a thousand people. So you can underestimate how many people are get, going to know about this. And so uh, thank you so much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for being part of this very interesting session. We have been talking about breast cancer in Cameroon. I always do an effort to capture some few things just for those who tune in late. And we have uh, heard from Muno first, uh, just giving us some highlights about cancer, which is characterized by uncontrolled and abnormal growth of cells in our body. And uh, we, he said there are two main groups uh, uh, of cancers. We have the blood cancers and the solid tumors and that 5% of uh, the number of cancers exist in Africa. So at first it never used to be an African problem, but now it's really right our, at our doorsteps. Breast cancer is the most common cancer in women. And uh, we, we, we heard the statistics. It's really uh, alarming now in Cameroon where uh, efforts are really made now to screen for cancer. And Muno always says, if you don't look for it, you will not see it. And I think we are getting uh, a very high prevalence of breast cancer because there is a lot more that is done as far as, as screening is concerned. We also heard that 20.1% of all cancers in Cameroon is breast cancer. And of course, men also in men, uh, 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 prostate cancer is even more uh, common among men. Breast cancer accounts for 24.2% of global cancer incidence and 15% of global cancer mortality and that uh, there is uh, no guidelines for screening for breast cancer in Cameroon, considering that screening is very important because early screening will lead to better prognosis. And we look at some of the methods of uh, screening for cancer. We saw that there is a breast self-examination. We have clinical exams, uh, mammogram and uh, ultrasound, as well as MRI, which is very rare in our setting in Cameroon. Uh, Muno also gave us some of the risk factors for breast cancer, and he said aging is one of the major risk factors for breast cancer. Other risk factors he uh, enlisted were obesity, uh, 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 eating a lot of processed food, and um, not breastfeeding, some, uh, among other uh, 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 risk factors. But just the fact that you are aging really places your risk of getting breast cancer a little bit more. Uh, he looked at some of the prevention guidelines and said, first, it's good to really check the high risk uh, lesions in our body. That's very important. Uh, strong family history. It's very good to do your assessment and be able to know your family history. Genetic predisposition and just like checking for BRCA mutation accounts for 15 to 20 percent of our family uh, uh, breast cancer risk. So that's very important for us to do our BRCA test, as he mentioned. And uh, all women should have uh, a risk assessment by the age of 30, just to know exactly where you belong in terms of your risk classification for breast cancer. Annual mammography uh, screening starts at the age of 40 and screening should continue past the age of uh, 74. These were some of those uh, highlights we got from Muno. And look, 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 looking at the kind of treatments that exist out there, Muno said treatment could range from uh, surgery, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, hormone therapy, and even targeted uh, 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 therapies, as well as immunotherapy and palliative care, uh, palliative and supportive care. So, but he said, when doing this treatment, we should pay attention to hormone therapy because almost 80% of breast cancer uh, patients will test uh, uh, positive for estrogen and uh, progesterone and will need hormone therapy. So we should always pay a lot of attention on hormone therapy. Uh, Muno said men don't think that there is no breast cancer among men. 1% of breast cancer is found in men. And so it is also important that uh, while carrying out a campaign against uh, breast cancer or just for awareness, we should involve men just for the fact that they are also uh, concerned about this. Um, we now got to the point to listen to our uh, own guest here, Akwi Anjo, who really, really presented just more of her life experience as a survivor of breast cancer. And she said, I quote, she never had breast exam before. She never, she's not obese. She, she eats well, no family history, but felt some little pain in her, uh, uh, under her uh, armpit. Ignored it at first, but later when the pain persisted, uh, she checked and further found a lump. 
and uh, you know she was 33 at that time then went for care and was told that she had triple negative for breast cancer at stage three she did chemotherapy surgery and radiation which are some of the uh, treatment modalities that Mona mentioned and she had a lumpectomy and she survived cancer she decided to share her story on social media and took this challenge to make sure that she fights uh, and educate many more people to be aware of breast cancer. And I quote what she said, no matter what you're going through, trust the process, listen to doctors and remain positive. And I still quote her, she said, I never had to worry about the cost of my treatment because I work and I have insurance. But after listening from the women back home who reached out to me, their major concern was, they worry about how to pay for their care. I started helping them and sending them money and the treatment and the demand for money kept increasing because the treatment is a lengthy one. That is how uh, Angel Appy decided to form the Dare to Live with Angel Foundation, which she launched in 2019. And uh, this foundation is uh, aimed at focusing on creating awareness on breast cancer. And she goes back home every year to educate our people, conducting campaigns to let women know about breast cancer and to help them know the importance of early screening for breast cancer. Anjo is doing amazing work. Akwe Anjo is really, really a hero we should be celebrating for her boldness, her resilience in really taking the fight against breast cancer back home and helping other women to uh, get aware of uh, the importance of even just self-breast examination. We want to thank her so much. And of course, she has provided her website here on our chat with her link and email, please, if you can support the Acqui, uh, uh, the Dare to, Dare to Live uh, uh, with Angel Foundation, you will be doing an amazing work of just helping women back home to fight against breast cancer. I want to thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for taking time this weekend to be with us again on the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. I want to thank uh, Brian Tegomo for co-moderating the session with me and also our own chair, Mono, for the leadership and for always making sure that we get the best of experts to come here every fortnight to talk on issues that affect the health of our people back home. I want to say that at the end of this session, we always stay back on the, on the parking lot just to network among ourselves, share contacts, but of course, just chat on some of the things that we never had time to discuss on during the official part of this session. So thank you so much. And I wish you a very uh, nice weekend while we hope to uh, see those of you who will have time to stay with us at the parking lot for us to uh, continue this discussion. So once again, Wish you a very nice weekend and see you again in a fortnight for another session of the town hall.